Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoyed the podcast. Have a great day. I'm Marty. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a member of the Prince George Group in Hamilton. I don't think, uh, I mean, I, this is way too formal, right? Like, this is crazy. I had no idea what I was coming into. And I think, I think what I, it was really important is to, uh, hang on a second. I spilled coffee on my tie and everything already. Hold on. I just gotta loosen up a little bit. That's it, that's it. That's it. Okay. So, okay, so. Huh? Yeah, Schwartzy. Um, so, what we got, like. I asked, uh, I asked, uh, Chris and Dave up to Hamilton in the spring, um, Hamilton, Ontario, and, uh, they just did a bang up job, and I gotta tell you that, uh, I don't know if I told them yet, I shouldn't have told Dave yet, but, uh, they've been talking about that presentation since. I've done many of them, and, uh, uh, it wasn't just what happened uh, uh, with the material that was delivered. It was the ambiance and the affectious uh, love for Alcoholics Anonymous that caught on. And it's hard sometimes for, for, if you're around here in the six, seven, eight year range, it's hard to understand how people can still have this passionate love affair with Alcoholics Anonymous because your ego and your mind is probably already telling you, is this all there is? Well, I'm going to tell you something. These guys demonstrate for me that there's a lot more to Alcoholics Anonymous than I ever dreamed possible. And it's for that reason that it's not, it's not hard for me to jump in a vehicle and, and make a trip, especially when I'm not driving and paying for it. And uh, <laughs> I want to thank Kevin so much for, uh, for, for making all of this happen. I got word in, in, uh, in the fall that, that this was going to be taking place, which is what I think is you know, plenty of notice. And uh, here's the flyer. So it says, Hammering Home the Principles. I mean, everybody in Hamilton would be laughing their ass off if they knew you guys had asked me to come down here to talk about spiritual principles. <laughs> but I didn't let you know that till I got here. So, but it goes on to say that I'm going to take you through the big book of three one-hour sessions. Now, I prepared an incredible, I mean, it was incredible talk today. I worked night and day, hours on end for months on this presentation. It was, there was AV, there was all kinds of charts, and it was, a, it was, it was spectacular. And then I met you all last night and thought, no, you're a lot sicker than that. So, <laughs> so at 1.30 in the morning, uh, Kevin and I put this thing together, and uh, my only hope is that you have as much fun sort of taking it up with me, not from me, taking it up with me as Kevin and I had doing it, because you can hear I've lost my voice again. It's because we couldn't stop laughing. And i got to tell you, Hey, we're, we're alcoholics, but we're not right, you know what I mean? <laughs> it doesn't matter if we're drinking or we're not drinking, and uh, we're just not right. And how could it be that I had since September? And, 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 and you know, I, I'm so nervous, and I told anybody that asked me today, asked me how I was doing, and, and, and I feel ashamed a little bit, i got to be honest, a little bit that I am so nervous, because, because I do believe in God. I believe in the power to put, you know, all of us into the place that we can... We could talk like this and communicate like this because this isn't my life. This is not my life, you know. And the other thing that I wish that had happened is if I, I wish, just wish I had been telling you my story first. It might, what I'm about to talk about in a few minutes might make a little bit more sense. Um, but, uh, you know, what we came up with, what I came up with, what, and then Kevin did all the work for, was that uh, <laughs> I'd like to steal this from you, actually. Um, <laughs> is this here every week? Uh-huh. It, it, this is your placard. Yeah. And... We're talking about hammering home the principles, probably because of the play on Hamilton. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the other it's genius, man. <laughs> the other choice is Clamato and Recovery. Clamato and Recovery, yeah. Okay, okay. Um, I'll get to that. Um, I believe in Alcoholics Anonymous. I, I, I really believe in Alcoholics Anonymous. And... When I saw the topic, that, that works. That works for Marty Cosgrove. That just works because um, I don't necessarily... I'm not known as a guy who fools around in AA. You know? i got like 19 recording devices here. I'm just going to shuffle them over here. Um, and I know... Uh, did everybody bring their Living Sober book? <laughs> <laughs> what about 
12 and 12. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you very quickly about 12 and 12. Because if anybody knows me and knows my story in Alcoholics Anonymous, we have a part in our book that says we have to find where other people are right. We have to look and see where other people have ideas and thoughts that might jive with our own. And I'm not anti-12 and 12. I just got sober. Let me rephrase that. I was just involved in my sobriety with the 12 and 12 for 14 years, having never taken a step or a direction in the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. But I knew the 12 and 12 inside out. And if you're a Sandy Beach fan like I am, that's not a bad thing. It's not a terrible thing. There's a lot of good stuff in the 12 and 12. And if you do have your big book, what I want to do is turn your attention to page 174. That's the first thing I would like to do to get kicked off. Um, I missed anything? No, but that's the one I'm sorry. Yeah, I asked, oh, see, what I did is I got it all put together. It's not in your big book. Sorry. <laughs> Anybody here got 12 and 12? <laughs> okay, I, want, I just want to read something to you, and I'll show you the pertinence. I'll show you how the relevance can, can sometimes be, uh, be helpful for us. This is new. This whole glasses thing. I uh, I was uh, in, involved in a car accident in April, and uh, on April the 22nd, and uh, I hit my head. And um, just now, the sort of ramifications of that head injury are starting to show themselves. The um, um, visual cortex or something is still vibrating, so I can't see very well. But the, the thing where you're going to probably notice it the most is that I don't necessarily always close loops. So. Because there's no new guys in here, we won't worry about that. I'll expect you to be able to close the loops yourself. We're all of like mine. But I also said this to some people before I got up here, too. you got something to say. Or if you just want to say, Marty, that's a load of bullshit. Don't leave. Say that and stay. And, and please, if you got something you want to say, just, just, just say it. You don't have to raise your hand. Just say it out loud. This is a nice small group. We can make this quaint. We're going to be together for the next couple hours. We can really do this nice. And then we're going to eat. And I'm really good at that, too. Um, okay, so what it says here is it says... On page 174, in Tradition 9 of the 12 and 12, it says, Unless each member follows to the best of his ability our suggested 12 steps to recovery, he almost certainly signs his own death warrant. His drunkenness and dissolution are not penalties inflicted by people in authority. They result from his personal disobedience to spiritual principles. They result from his personal, his disobedience to spiritual principles. And we were talking about it when we were at the breakfast this morning. We were talking about direction we sometimes get from our sponsors. And and, 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 and 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 guys like me will, will sort of pounce on that stuff and you know your sponsor's not to be involved in that and you, you shouldn't be telling anybody what to do and all that kind of stuff. Well, who else is gonna tell you? You know, and what it says here is it, it's, it tells me about how important obedience is. Obedience to spiritual principles. Now when I get this this title, I go online, I check out some resources, I understand, you know, if I was to ask for a list from GSO, they would send me a list of spiritual principles of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's on a little card, and it's a big book index. And nobody anywhere has ever written that these are the spiritual principles of Alcoholics Anonymous. What they say is, and this is another 12 of 12 quote from the forward, maybe my last one, it says, these steps embody spiritual principles that if practiced as a way of life can expel the obsession to drink and enable the sufferer to become happily and usefully whole. Does everybody know that? You ever know that piece from the 12 and 12? These steps embody spiritual principles. So what I'm talking about here from the 12 and 12 says we're really talking about spiritual principles in Alcoholics Anonymous, but we need to be obedient to them and we need to know that these steps embody those spiritual principles. And what are the principles? That's up to you to decide. There's many, Barefoot Bill has half a dozen of them on his site. He's from Jersey, right? He's got half a dozen of them on his site. If you, if you were to send a GSOD again, they'd give you this little card. And I put in the inside of my book, honesty, faith, hope, dependence, courage, integrity, willingness, brotherly love, uh, willingness, humility, brotherly love, restitution, perseverance, communication with God, and charity. Those are the 12 principles that I was taught to practice in Alcoholics Anonymous when it says we practice these principles in all our affairs. I can grade my degree of living that at night in prayer using those earmarks. I can see the degree to which I'm living a life of, of spiritual principles using those earmarks. Does that make sense? So, and we can get in there and we can get into the nuances of that and we can argue that stuff, but it doesn't make any sense to argue it, right? So it says that Marty will take you through the big book in three one-hour sessions. What we had come up with uh, to do that was the book makes two references throughout 
is the how and the why. He wants us to understand that Alcoholics Anonymous, and you guys have heard this before, but I'm going to say it again to somebody that maybe hasn't. In its inception, Alcoholics Anonymous was a 12-step spiritual program. That's in its inception, it was a 12-step spiritual program driven by the Oxford movement, driven by past experiences and understanding. It was a 12-step spiritual program with a supportive fellowship. Okay, so you have this 12-step spiritual program. And then this supportive fellowship. And why would it be like that? But because it was three knuckleheads in Jersey getting sober, at the same time there was three guys in Hamilton, Ontario getting sober, and three guys in Washington getting sober, and three guys in Florida getting sober. We weren't getting together once a week. There were no meetings. You know, and if there was a meeting, there'd be a couple of guys there, and in between that meeting and the next meeting, I got your list. I stole one of your group lists. I don't know if you have to pay for it, but I stole it already, so. Does that cost money? No. Look at this, look at this, look at this. You guys got a few meetings you get to get to, eh? That's like all of Canada, right there. I should you not. And so, there's a lot of fellowshipping going on. A lot of fellowshipping. You got fellowshipping for, for gay time guys. You got fellowshipping for women, for, for, for kids. You got mornings, afternoons, evenings. Lots of fellowshipping. Lots of fellowshipping. It's a 12 step spiritual program with a support of fellowship. Now, you fast forward to the year, I'm going to say 1987, because I can't speak about alcoholics and I was before that. What we have is we have a fellowship with an optional 12-step program. And this is where I'm preaching in the choir. Not everybody in Alcoholics Anonymous takes the steps. I know you're shocked, so hold on to your seats. I know you're shocked. And there are guys in this room that have gotten in a lot of trouble in Alcoholics Anonymous for pointing that out. And to you I say, keep pointing it out. Just learn a nicer way to do it. You know? um, because being unpopular in Alcoholics Anonymous isn't, isn't terrible. But it, I'm going to be open and honest here with you because in case this recording ever the best gets back to the fellowship in, in Hamilton. I need you. I, I, I need you to survive. And I have put myself in the peril of ostracization in the community I come from because I don't dick around. Because I hammer home the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous. Because I care more about whether you live than I do about how you feel. You come to Alcoholics Anonymous. You come to this 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 this, this program. And and we have on the walls and, and, and in our hearts and we have this 12-step program. And you'll stay here for four years and never Take the program. I mean, that's insane. That's, that's, that's more crazy than taking the next drink, I think. How could you be 30 years in a 12-step program and have never taken the steps? How can you do that? And I don't care about the quality of life. i got guys in my group who I absolutely love, who, who probably live by spiritual principles of another experience. And because they're wonderful people. One of the guys that I'm talking about came and tugged on my, he's 34 years sober, tugged on my shirt about a few years ago, and he said, I think I'm one of those guys. He's a witch guy. I never took the steps. This man has helped so many people in Alcoholics Anonymous, it's not funny. He's been there, he's paid their bills, he's gone to their place, he's gone to their weddings, he's a godfather to 26 AA babies. He's, he's, the man's an amazing man. And I wish he was my dad. If I had to handpick a dad, it'd be this guy. But I don't know. I don't know. Why I have to do the things I have to do to get to where he has to be, where he is. He didn't have to do these things. So I spent a lot of time looking at people like that and pointing my finger. And I spent, and it wasn't healthy. It wasn't healthy. It got me a lot of speaking gigs. It got me involved in a lot of different areas of service. But it wasn't healthy inside. My heart and love and tolerance for people is our code. I, that can't change. I have to see fighting everyone and everybody. That can't change because because I'm really right, <laughs> you know, and they're all really wrong. I can't, can't change because of that, because I'm on the side of the right. It can't. It has to be that when I get the opportunity like this with you people, I saw many of you at the meeting I was at last night. I hope she shows up today. Um, I have to be open and honest about my experience. So, and I'll talk about that later. So, and, and, you know, there's nothing, uh, there's nothing inside of me that, uh, um, is going to be, uh, I think new from a, from a, a knowledge perspective to anybody here. I just don't. 
the way we've broken it down is we're going to talk about trusting God, cleaning house, and helping others. And is there anybody in this room tonight, 30 days or less, 40 days, 60 days, 30 days or less? I need to ask you. I'm going to ask you straight. Hey, you were here setting up and everything, man. That's great stuff. Great stuff. Uh, are you offended or, or disturbed in any way in talking about God or the power? Does that trouble you in any, any way? Okay. Good. Beautiful. Because you know, I'm going to be talking to you guys. I said when we were coming in, is a lot of like-mindedness isn't always a good thing. You know, it's not always a good thing. When there's brand new people coming in or people coming in from detoxes and stuff and you're carrying a message like this, isn't it nice when they're there? Because who are you talking to after the meeting until 2 o'clock in the morning? You're not talking to the guy that just got everything confirmed. You know, you know there's people going to walk out of here at 7 o'clock tonight and say, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I think. And they're going to go home and they're going to watch that football game they, they, they taped today, the DVR, right? The new guy's going to go, holy shit. Or the new girl's going to go, there's a level of something here that is not what I thought. That's not what my therapist or the treatment center said. You know, I don't know if I strike you as a Bible thumper. Do I? Um, but I am on fire for this. I'm on fire for, for, for God. I'm on fire for the power. So what I want to, in, in, so the way we, we looked at it is the how and the why of it. Trust God, clean house, help others. So anybody got any questions? Anybody got anything they'd like to throw in? You can totally deflect in, in the whole thing. Anybody? You guys got nothing to say? Shut. Thought we had this all planned out. <laughs> um, I got a question. You want us to remove, uh, remove some of the crisis on the tables? So that Will they be? They're going to go flying at some point. Like I'm trying my hardest to keep everything stable, but I get uh, I get sort of moving around and stuff. And uh, I put my sure. <laughs> this has plenty of reach on it. Oh, yeah. Some of these things are fantastic. You can be in the back of a room this size and just point it. It's amazing. Okay. So, um, are you asking uh, if we have any questions about how it works quite like here? About that, or you can ask, if you want to, if something you want to hear about, is, or my take on something, by all means, or if you're struggling, if there's something you're struggling with, I want you to throw that out here because we got a treatment for it. Have you questioned the relevancy of what occurred in the 30s as it has in the way today? See, Bill's, have you questioned the relevancy of what Bill went through and Dr. Silkworth found out and what the early alcoholics uh, experienced versus your life today and how has that affected uh, what you did? Anybody hear that? Anybody else understand it? That's <laughs> <laughs> um, a uh, great question, Dave. Uh, <laughs> Coming out of the gate, uh, I'm gonna be honest with you too. Anytime you say the word the name Bill Wilson, I think of James Woods. And anytime you say, anytime you say the name Dr. Bob, I think of James Garner. I don't think they would be terribly offended by that. Uh, pretty tight cast, but um, when I talk tonight, and this is where this is where this comes in. When I talk tonight, you'll see that my Alcoholics Anonymous story is very relevant to the 30s. I don't have an Alcoholics Anonymous story of treatment. Therapists, although all those things were in my life, uh, I was 17 years old, and a psychiatrist said, do you have a drinking problem? And I said, oh, really? And he said, yeah, you drink, you feel guilty, you drink. Yeah? No, that's, that's, that's your assessment. <laughs> well, this psychiatrist committed suicide about 10 years ago, but... Uh, and I don't mean that, it's just, like, it's like, it's not unusual, right? But... <laughs> that's that's my therapy experience. Uh, the treatment centers, and most people are driven in here by some sort of uh, recovery tools, assessment tools, some sort of measure of therapy or treatment. Most people. Not a lot of people are making the call to AA and then getting here, although there's probably some people in here that that's your, that's your experience. That's not the norm anymore. And uh, I think that that's the major difference, is that, and I don't want to tip my hand, but some of these may not be here anyway, but, I didn't ever come to AA. AA. AA kept coming to me. And I talked about it last night. You know, and, I, and, and I, you know, I'm going to get to you know page 20 at some point. Uh, at some point there. Our very lives as ex-problem drinkers depend upon our constant thought of others and how we might help meet their needs. When a person is in trouble, they must go and find somebody to be of help. 
They don't need to call the therapist or call their, their sponsor or call. They need to find somebody they can help. That's the message of Alcoholics Anonymous that existed in the 30s. It's the message I get today. It's the message Bill experienced in the Mayflower Hotel. It's the message that he and Bob experienced together in the, at, right after the talk. It's the experience that the third guy in the bed experienced as soon as he got the word was that, holy crap, I see how this works. When I'm not feeling right, go help somebody. That's not the message today. So the relevance today is, is, is very pertinent because it's how I, it's, I've been able to live my life like that. I don't necessarily frame it up from a, from a then and now. What I know is that when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous in 1987, I had never seen, I did not see a big book on the tables of the meetings that I was going to. It never was there. And people would call me on that in Hamilton and say, you just didn't see it. And I said, you're full of shit. And even if it was there, what was it doing? Propping something else up? Because nobody opened it. Nobody read it. Nobody talked about it. There were meetings at the area social club where people would read the stories in the back and share their own personal wine drinking experiences relative to the story. But there was never anything. Like the book just seemed dated. The book seemed really dated. And I'm going to just quickly talk about this. If you look on page 65, you know where it is. It doesn't matter. It, at the resentment piece, okay? So you're looking at the inventory. I looked at that way back in my early sobriety and said, how lame is that? How lame is that? That couldn't possibly be pertinent to a knucklehead like me. And when you find out the kinds of things that I was involved in, the kinds of things, that, that, is more, that isn't going to scratch the surface, not even touch it. And then there's this other piece in the back of text. And it moves it to text and it talks about some other columns. It talks about some other work to be done in that four step. I never saw that there. Nobody pointed that out to me. I had a sponsor. I had, I went to meetings every single day for the first five years I was sober. Nobody pointed that out to me. So that's the relevance. There was no, you came to Alcoholics Anonymous in 1935, 36, 37, 38, 39. You came to the door because someone brought you to AA. And they took you into a room and they prayed on you. And then when you took the steps, you came into a meeting and shared what your experience was like. That's how it worked. Now, doors are wide open. People come in at any point and they can share whatever the hell they want because we don't want to offend them or drive them away. I don't know why we're on a membership drive here, but I really don't give a shit. <laughs> I really don't give a shit. We need to weed people out. Not, not, we don't need to be driving them in. We need to, if you're an alcoholic of our type, this shit works for you. And if you're not, you're going to hang around here long enough just to piss me off. <laughs> and then my work becomes ineffective because I become angry and upset and I get ineffective. I just, people stop hearing me. And they tell me that. Those people they'll come up. I really liked your message, but I you know, really started throwing shit around and started kicking stuff. And I wasn't even going to do that today, but. I was really going to stay temperate today. Um, just, just that's why I said to Kevin, Kevin says, why don't you just lean this up here? It's because this podium is not going to be staying still. Um, anyway, so I, I don't know if I touched on the question. I think, uh, I think the depiction, and the reason I talked about James Woods and James Garner was because I think the depiction that's displayed in that movie comes from the heart of an alcoholic. And I can't watch the scene of the communion between those two men without crying. And if you're an alcoholic of our type, I'm going to fucking start crying now, man. If you're an alcoholic of my type, and you lived where the darkness and the dissolution and, and, and the pain, I can talk about the men who are dead now, who came and carried a message to me, because they needed to stay alive themselves. It was for no vain glory or anything. They're gone. They're, they're gone. You know, so, you know, and, and we'll, hopefully we'll, you know, we'll get to that and help in others. So we'll stop it. Um, no more questions. <laughs> <laughs> Every second line, I have don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. My material, my material is going to go fine. You're going to muck it up. Okay. I'm, I'm only kidding. What's your name? Hi, I'm Patty. Hi, Patty. Hi, Patty. Hi, Patty. So this is a great group of, of drunks to ask this question. Uh, I don't know how many people. Uh, you know, how passionate you guys all are about the 12 steps and resting. Uh, you know, all my channels are there and looking for the true alcoholics, and, and um, you know, I'm, I'm really learning more and more how to take one of these steps. So here's my question. When, the, when someone is moving and their life is out of the world, and their life's in wreckage, 
you know, I, there's a lot of stuff that possesses us. Like, should I sign a contract that my husband is making me sign that I sign over the kids in the house and my hands on the kids? And so they ask us to sign. And the car's impounded. And what do they do with the car? And things that aren't necessarily, but they, but I can't say a sponsor, sole responsibility is to take the steps. Because they got all those stuff before. And they have nobody else to ask. So, what you, do? you know, I asked my sponsor, who I trust, and she's awesome, and, and she's right there with me on phone set off. But sometimes she's like me. That's what you're looking for. And together we're like, we're not sure. And so, you know, I'm sure as you guys are all wrestling, and some of you go outside, like, you know, and we, you know, what do we do with this? We all run into those people that are coming in here with a, a huge amount of debris behind them, um, uh, uh, crime and pain and, and bills and, and losing their homes and their families and children issues. A lot of women with, with child, uh, you know, child services issues. We are experts. We really are experts only in one one capacity, and that's alcoholism. Now, what happens is that we have to remember it's not just drinking. It's alcoholism. We, we have we have a familiarity with the disease and we have a familiarity, hopefully, with the recovery process. That's what we can attend to. We can attend to that through the 12 steps. One of the magical things about getting somebody see, behind, and we're going to talk, and when I get into the trust God piece, I, mean, I don't know what you think of when you think of first things first. You know, Me, I think of the other alcoholic. But very closely behind it, I think of God. And some days are interchangeable. Some days. You know, the space between you and me is where God lives. So I need that alcoholic for God to be present, and I need God to be present when I'm with the other alcoholic. Have you guys ever, like, you hear when two alcoholics get together, God shows up? Have you ever golfed with an alcoholic? It's no fucking love. It's dangerous. I mean, clubs are flying around, it's cursing, and, you know, it's, something, it's to be survived sometimes doing shit with other alcoholics. Bowling, they're cheating on their scores, you know, they're lying. But when two alcoholics get together for the purpose of recovery, I don't know, something enters a room. Something powerful enters a room. And we know what that's like because we can be strangers. And we can sit at a table across from one another and just start opening up. It's weird stuff. The rest of the world thinks we're freaks. They really do. Like, you can just start talking about, you know, 30 seconds we're talking about child services stuff. You know, my ex-husband and my new husband and the boyfriend. and you know, It's all coming out. Like, within 30 so we have this thing going on. It's it's a language of the heart, Bill referred to it. So these things aren't going to stay. We need to be clear of this stuff. Now, in answer to your question specifically, this process was never meant to be long and enduring. This process was meant to be fairly rapid and quick. The woman that you're talking about specifically needs to be pointed directly to the power. And if she can't, she says, I can't deal with the power right now. I have to deal with child support or child services. You say, child services is not going anywhere. But if you don't get this right, that won't matter. And it's always about taking the person back, first things first. It's always about taking the person back to the work. The answers are to whatever it is that's plaguing them or ailing them are in the steps. We're here talking about the 12 spiritual principles. We're not talking about Alcoholics Anonymous so you don't drink. We're talking about applying 12 spiritual principles to all aspects of our life. And then we do that through the reconciliation with somebody who has already been there. And not just the circumstances, but you've had painful circumstances in your life. Thank God you didn't allow them to come before your relationship with God. Or you wouldn't have a message to carry. If you let her put the circumstances of her life before God, she won't have a message to carry to the girl behind you. She'll always say to the girl behind her, you know what, you need to get that stuff all straightened out and then come back and see us. And she'll end up eating a piece. That's what I'll, she'll end up tying up or overdosing her. And that's how we die. That's how we lose people. And we don't lose them when they're drinking. We lose them in between drinks. We lose them when they can't live with it and they can't live without it. And they say, I don't want to live. I don't want to be around here anymore. Boom. And they're gone. And it looks a lot like all that calamity. But it's not. It's about not having a relationship with a power that could have delivered her to some, to some freedom and some peace. So we gotta believe that, we gotta believe that from our deep, the deepest part of our own need, you know? We have to believe that from the deepest part of our own desire and our own requirements. You know, we know, we, if you came to Alcoholics Anonymous and you're just like a little bit alcoholic, 
then you're going to recover really good on just a little bit of this stuff I'm talking about. <laughs> but if you were a pig, <laughs> like if you were a low down gluttonous pig alcoholic and I'm not just talking about drinking I'm talking about for everything you just need more of everything more booze, more sex, more dope, more parties more fun, more sleep, more whatever you just need more if you're that person well, how does that stop when you come here I'm going to get right to the comfortable spot and then stop I'm as much a pig in alcoholics now as I ever was a, ever and I just need more and I need more and I drive to Jersey to get it. And I got it last night. I got it last night. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I already said I hope she shows up. There was a woman in your, in your midst last night who was on fire. And she was beaming her. She didn't have anybody sitting beside her. She didn't have any reason to be smiling the way she was smiling. She didn't have any sort of, but there was something going on in her that I drove down from Hamilton to see. And it's a fire and a passion and a love for Alcoholics Anonymous and, and the alcoholics. And that's the stuff that I will continuously travel to find and to see and to be around. So that because she can carry a message of depth and weight to someone. I, somebody had said to me after, because I mentioned it, and they said, you should have seen her a couple of years ago. <laughs> We're always really quick to tear people down. They don't, they don't know that's actually a, a that's actually a com- uh, compliment. You know what I mean? You say you should have seen him a couple of years ago. That's a compliment. You're damn right it is. <laughs> I know. Should have seen him six months ago. <laughs> Kevin and I were driving over here, and we he said, "You see, notice Anthony settled down a little bit." I said, "Yeah, I really like it." Kevin says, "I don't. <laughs> I like when he's wild and crazy." Okay, so I'm gonna try. I'm gonna run through this stuff at a fairly rapid pace. Um. And I just want you to stay with me, okay? And, and if you've got your book in front of you, great. If you don't, that's okay. So the first thing I want to turn to is XXVIII. I have no idea what number that is <laughs> at all. I'm Roman Catholic, but not Roman. <laughs> and I'll get a little quicker at this as we go. Like I say, this was 1.30 in the morning. Where's unless? Where is it? Where do you see the unless, Dave? Okay? Unless the first... At the bottom, at the bottom, at the very bottom. Yeah, it's not even getting a sense. That's why I couldn't find it. Okay, so it says, unless they can again experience the sense of ease from which... Uh, the sense of ease and comfort which comes by taking a drink. Okay? That... the until they have an entire psychic change is the important piece. So the phenomenon of craving develops, and unless a person can experience an entire psychic change, XXIX, unless a person can have experience an entire psychic change, there's very little hope of his recovery. So what we're talking about here, we're talking, we're going to talk about trust God, but we're going to talk about the why first. Okay? We're going to talk about the whys first. And I'm, I, my direction is just to take you through the book. You all got books? Hopefully, is that all highlighted in everybody's books? Anybody need a highlighter? <laughs> I didn't got any. I just had to. You know. okay. Now, if you've got a pen, underline that. I mean, that's an important piece. Unless an entire psychic change. It doesn't say partial psychic change. It talks about an entire psychic change. I want you to think about how you were thinking the day before you got sober. What were you thinking about the day before you got sober? And we're moving into something that isn't a partial change. It's an entire change. Can you see that page number again? It's XXIX. Uh, what's the starting paragraph? Go down to where it says, unless this person can experience an entire psychic change. Bottom of XXIII. No, uh, next page. XXIX. Hey, I confused you at first. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, is it, are they different page numbers in the third edition? Yeah. I think you've got a Canadian book, right? <laughs> An accurate one, you mean. <laughs> uh, many of us have the second edition. Uh, oh, this is going to be interesting. <laughs> this is going to be really interesting. The first word in the paragraph. Okay, the first par- the first word in the paragraph, like it's the sense of ease and comfort, which wants to, on my book is the top of the page. Is that the top of your page? The sense of ease and comfort? Yeah. On the to page X X I X. The beginning of the paragraph. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And the maroon book is X X V I I. X X V I I. Seventeen. Of course it is. 
I should move right into the first. The 164 pages aren't different, right? No, they're not. But these ones are going to be all over the place, right? Yes, they are. Okay. You know, I'm not going to take a long time on this anyways, guys, so we're going to whip right through it, okay? <laughs> if you know where this stuff is that I'm referring to is in your book, have at it. I never even thought of that. I never even thought of that. Okay, so uh, in the first edition, big book, I refer forward to the first edition. It says on page X, I, I, I. Hang on a second. I should have just stayed in the Living Silver book. <laughs> <laughs> Has everybody got the forward to the first in front of them? In the first paragraph, just look down and it says, The alcoholic is a very sick person. Mm. That's a, quite a pronouncement. Now, we're talking about why. Why trust God? If anybody's never seen this before, and I read you from, from the forward in the back, that, that thing in the forward in the back was something from Dr. Bob. This is the prescription that Dr. Bob wrote, and the date is 1937. It's not that far along in, in, in the process of his own recovery. And he wrote that, he said, always, always remember it. Trust God, clean house, help others. Why would we need to trust God? Well, the alcoholic is a very sick person is a good reason. And the doctor's opinion uh, on XXIX, if you got a fourth edition, I apologize, I'm not sure where the other one is. I should probably get Kev up here. You can find it, no problem. Um, something more than human power? You know where that is? Faced with this problem, if the doctor is honest with himself, he must sometimes feel his own inadequacy. Although he gives all that is in him, it is often not enough. I want you to think about doctors, therapists. I want you to think about treatment centers. I even want to think about your families. Often it's not enough. One feels that something more than human power is needed to produce the essential psychic change. So now we know we're a very sick person. Now we know we need an entire psychic change. Now we know that it's essential. This psychic change is essential. It's very, very. It's, it's, it's not just a, a passing thing that's going to occur. And it's, it, we need this. It has to happen. This is the why. This is the why of it. Uh, then we get down to XXIX, same page. It says, um, once a psychic change has occurred, it's just above what I just read. Once a psychic change has occurred, all that's really necessary is that they inquire that they follow a few simple rules. It's, it, 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 it's the first time that Bill sort of makes any sort of reference to the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and he refers to them as rules. Alcoholics don't like rules. I don't like rules. But he's calling them as long as they're able to follow a few simple rules. And he's talking about the program. He's talking about the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous there. They will, the only effort necessary to have this, this psychic change is if they follow a few simple rules. Now, if you don't accept the things that are laid out in this book wholly, you will always be around Alcoholics Anonymous picking and choosing what works for you and doesn't work for you. For some strange reason, many years ago, I was open to the idea that this stuff was, was viable for me. It was viable in my life. As an alcoholic of this variety, this stuff all applies to me. There was no editing. I couldn't edit it. And I'm glad I didn't. More stuff has been revealed, but I'm glad I didn't. It goes on to talk about uh, how, the how, no, this second, that's, I'm going to put that in the other thing. Um, on XXX, my book, it says most alcoholics are doomed, right? Most chronic alcoholics are doomed. That's a pretty good why. That's a pretty good why. We know we're powerless. You know, and I said to Kevin when we were talking about this stuff in the first presentation, there's a lot of emphasis on powerless. I was coming at it from steps 1, 2, 3, 4 through 9, and 10, 11, 12. That's how the approach was going to be. And I said, you know what? We talk about part. If there's somebody new and it's really important, being powerless is a wonderful, wonderful acknowledgement because it opens up a world of opportunities. But this is we're already assuming that the people here are powerless. We're already assuming that people here have some understanding of their own personal powerlessness around alcohol. Whether you've had a step one experience or not is only, that's up to you, and only you know that. But if you're powerless, what is a natural, what is the natural sort of obligation or, or responsibility or thought that comes next? I need power. If I'm powerless, step one, I need power, step two. That's the acknowledgement. We're already moving into that place. We've only sort of rolled through some of the doctor's opinion stuff, and we're already moving into the place of, without power, I'm dead. With power, I can have an entire psychic change. We're still in the why. 
Right? And, 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 and I want to just drive this stuff home. I want to go over and over and over again. So now we can get into the pages upon which we can all agree, uh, which is really important. If I go to page one in Bill's story, he makes a reference, for I was hopeless. No. Is that page one? Page ten. Sorry. In my writing. <laughs> so we go to page ten. See at the top there it says, I had to be, for I was hopeless. Is there anybody in this room who did not feel hopeless the day before they got sober? Um, I was just thinking about how this related to Patty's, what she said. You know, we were talk- and I was thinking about something that happened this morning at church, and I was all waiting with that. We don't, a lot of times, we're not able, we don't want to follow the rules, and we're not willing to look at the solution that us are completely down. In the case where she said, the girls are. So the, the thing is, if this is the only way, this power, this is the perfect time to bring in the power to get them. Because as we all know, working with people, we work with people who are sick and sad and, and they feel like crap all the time and they're not happy, yet they won't, they won't do the program. They won't do what we show them. And the thing is, is that they won't, and it's just like we bang our heads. Why? Why? Why won't they just listen? Why won't they do this? We were telling them how to do this. Why won't they do it? And it's because they're not desperate. Desperate. Not Desperation's a powerful motivator. Desperate. And, and so many times when we were talking about Martin Luther King this morning, people were not willing to listen until they were at an absolute desperate point. So when we think about what, what she was saying, like that is the perfect time. That is the most vulnerable they'll be at. That is the best time to talk about God and power. Yeah, it is. And you know, and you have to be mindful of the fact that you're developing a relationship with people where they're watching you. You know, they're wrapped up in themselves pretty good. But they are watching you. And if they see you solving your problems through spiritual means, they'll they will be acclimatized to do that. But if they see you bumping your head and grinding stuff out all the time willfully, then they're gonna, they're not gonna get what it is that you're talking about. And so by demonstration, we have to be really strong in that regard as well. I want to say this at this juncture because the best material in all of Alcoholics Anonymous has already been stolen and said. Okay? And, and it just has. I mean, we regurgitate stuff here sometimes, we get some laughs and walk away and think, I didn't even make that up. You know, that's not even mine. I stole that. But I want people to remember Chuck Chamberlain stuff. I want people to remember the Sandy stuff. I want people to remember the Chris S. stuff, the Dave P. stuff. We have one problem, and that's disconnection. And we have one solution, and that's a reconnection. One problem, one solution. It can be the children's aid. It can be the, uh, the parole being revoked. It can be, you know, no money. It can be, uh, I want to drink. I'm a, uh, one problem, one solution. If we got our head around that, if we really believe that, then that will always come ahead of any problems. That will always come ahead of any problems. And you look in your own, if you're around alcohol, it's not five, six, eight, ten years. You look around in your own circles, in your own social circles, in your own recovery circles, and you will start to see stories of men and women who have survived calamity and difficulty that you may not feel that you might have been able to survive. And they did it with grace, and they did it with dignity. You know, and they did that with the power at the forefront. Same problems that I've been wrestling over. You know, same problems I've been, and we do do that. We'll hang on to something, we'll beat our heads to the wall, and one day we'll let it go and say, "Why didn't I do that three months ago?" <laughs> That's the alcoholic way. That's the alcoholic way. What happens when you get sober, become sober, and you land in this place of of a uh, 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 ten step world? As I like to call it, the ten step world, is that. That stuff doesn't stay with you that long. And the only difference between me and the nut job coming right out the street is the amount of time it takes me to repair it. That's the only difference. It's the same shit happens to him as happening. I get the same sensitive feelings and all that kind of stuff <laughs> as the new, brand new guy. The only difference is, is I, I probably worry about it for less, longer of a time. I probably uh, annihilate myself a little less. I probably, you see what I'm saying? It's all in the degrees. It's all in the degrees. But it comes from the power. You know, my immediate me, my immediate response to anything is usually wrong, usually. And I live my life, I live my life in, in, in trying to live in the world of the spirit. 
Yeah. Well, our reaction is typically, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's typically not the right way. We have to just work at that. It evolves, though. It evolves. Like, I, I, you know, some of us in here are professionals. Some of us actually have families that are still with us. Some of us, you know, we, we, we evolve. And the reason the people are still in our lives and we're able to hold down jobs when we couldn't before and all, it's because we're evolving. It's like, you know, we are evolving. And uh, there's a gentle, as much as I have a lot of edge and, and I've got a, a history and, and all, there's a gentleness to me that people see first now. There's a, an openness and a, and, a, and, a, and a camaraderie that people see first. That's not what they saw before. I mean, you get the feedback from people. You know, I used to be terrified of you. I hated your guts. And, and then now I need your help. Well, my first reaction is like, yeah, really? You tell them up in my face and tell me you judge the shit out of me. Now you want my help? Get locked. Oh, oh no, come here, come here, come here. But it's, uh, you know, I, I'm really happy you put that proposition out there because that's the age-old question in alcoholics and I'm anybody working with anybody and I'm so self. I don't know how many people have had problems today. How many people have had difficulties in their life today? It's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. There's a number, good number of alcoholics in this room. I'm sure you beat the shit out of somebody today. I'm sure there's people in here have hurt somebody today. You know, there's people in here that have to, that have to make amends after this today. I might be one of them, you know, so... <laughs> That's the way we, it's the way we live. And if I if I say no, I will not do that. Then I bring suffering into my life. I close off the power. I do no longer trust God. So this is one I'll handle. Thanks. Thank you. you know? and, and 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 like I love how Sandy says it. And of all the people who should not believe that there's one solution for all problems, there's alcoholics. You know? All of a sudden I come to AA and they say, well, there's no. You got no money? It's for anything. Hmm. <laughs> well, no, I, I need money. No, you got no money. Say this for anything. No. Dump up in your meat. Just don't put anything in the seven. No. Um, go find somebody to help. I need practical solutions, dude. I need two G's. Like I, don't need, I need money. That's not how we see it. Was, when we're wrapped up in self in the material world, that's how it looks. When I come and you old geezers there say, say the serenity prayer, what you're saying to me is you put God in front of it and you're not going to worry about not having any money. And something will come. You put God in front of it. And this is the old coots I'm talking about that, that I thought were bone powder dry. Sitting in the back of the room saying this shit. And the fact of the matter is, is that I can be free of all things. One problem, one solution. That sounds a lot like drinking. Of all the people that should not miss that, it should be us. Driving home, problem with the relationship, I'm having a couple of drinks. You walk in, you say to your buddy, say, hey, the old lady, bitch, you know, and he says, hey, let me buy you a drink. Sure, you know, though, one problem, one solution. Walk in and go bankrupt. Man, I'm losing my business. Hey, can I buy you a drink? Sure. I didn't need you to buy me a drink, actually. And so you start drinking. One problem, one solution. Nobody in this room should ever argue that that's a possibility. We come to Alcoholics Anonymous and we see that we can develop a relationship with a power that can remove all our problems. All of them. That's what the book says. We can solve all of our problems. The relationship with the power. My sponsor can't. My sponsor can't. But my sponsor can direct me to get a power that can solve all my problems. That's our job. It's our only job. I am a therapist. It's the bane of my existence in Alcoholics Anonymous. And it's not because when I say it, because I'm a lousy therapist. Right? <laughs> Oh, shit. I said that on tape. <laughs> it's because it's like that's not what we do here. We don't practice therapy. We practice experiential sharing. When one alcoholic shares with another alcoholic his experience, her experience, something is apt to happen. Something quite amazing is apt to occur. That's what happens in here. It don't happen in my therapeutic life. No. I had a guy, and real quickly, I quickly, quickly tried a story, and, and I'll just sort of get through some more of this stuff. You were right, Kevin. <laughs> um, uh, guy comes in, and we have a, some of you might have heard of the fast course, Stelco, a big steel companies in Hamilton. No? <laughs> major, major employer in our city. Our city has gone down to two because the U.S. Steel took them over. But, <clears throat> so they have a big EAP program, and, and I work for a private industry in Burlington, and and uh, as a cognitive therapist, and, and, but this one guy gets referred to me for uh, some addictions issues. And he comes walking into my office, and he says, now only, in, and like, I mean, therapists would handle, or normal therapists, or good therapists would handle this much differently. But he comes walking into the office, and he said, this is what happens. 
he says, uh, you know, he comes walking in and he sits down and he says, my wife's leaving me. Um, she's taking the kids. She tells me I'm not going to get to see my kids. Um, I'm, I'm on the brink of losing my job. I had to go to EAP. And they're telling me if I don't get some help, they're going to fire me. Uh, these are some serious issues. They're very serious issues. And I said, the guy would tell me a little bit about this. This is the first session now. First session. So tell me about, and I, I've got up 22 sessions with this guy. Locked in. And he starts telling me about this. He says, well, you know, I just play hockey and hang with the boys and stuff like that. And he says, what happens is that I get off of work on a Thursday, I get my paycheck, and I go over to the galley pump, and the guy cashes a check there for me. I have a few beers, you know, I can't stop once I start. Uh, a couple of days pass, I show up back home, there's no food for the kids, there's no, you know, no clothes for the kids. The wife's pissed off at me, and he's going, now we're getting to some stuff here, right? A lot of therapists would tell that guy to go to AA. Sounds like you have a drink problem, man. Go to AA. I said to him, sounds like you might have a drinking problem. He said, next week, why don't we go home this way? He said, pardon? You get your check on Thursday, we'll go home this way. That man's life totally changed. It's called Brief Intervention Solution Focused Therapy. You just take the facts as they come, and you change them. And if it doesn't work, you figure something else out. And if it doesn't work, you figure something else out. I'm 25 years in the business of therapy, and I've never made one referral to Alcoholics Anonymous. Because I don't meet us in, the, in therapy. I don't. I don't meet us in therapy. I meet us here, or in prison, or in hospitals. I don't meet us when you got 90 bucks to walk up and ask me to give you treatment for, 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 for a problem. You just don't. Why was I talking about that? I don't know why I was talking about that. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm not, so, yeah, and, and, and here I am sitting there full of this stuff, loving this stuff. You know, and this guy said, I can't stop once I start. But this guy never said he couldn't stop starting. He didn't qualify that way, which is a greater aspect of our disease because a lot of people can't stop when they start. You get in them, they like it, they keep going. We get in them, we can't stop. There's a difference. There's a difference. So this guy was on his way, and his life has changed exponentially. And I hear from him all the time. Good guy. A really good guy. The EAP person that referred him to me, she's an AA. She actually said to me, I don't know what you did with that guy. One session. Once I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything. He came up with the plan. He designed the plan. He came up with it. He's not one of us. But he could easily have been sent here, which is one of the, you know, pertinent to the, what I was talking about earlier. And he just sat at these tables, and he did not drink, and his wife would have got better and been a little bit happier and all that kind of stuff. So he just thought things were really going on. And somebody would have walked up to him and said, will you be my sponsor? And he would have said, sure, I'll be your sponsor. I'm four and a half years sobered, man. And he said, well, what's these step things you're talking about? I don't know. I didn't do them, so let's just uh, go golfing. And uh, this guy then would have some problems in his life, and he'd, he'd end up getting all screwed up. And he'd say to his sponsor, but I'm going to meetings. And it'd get all confusing. And that's what we hear. That's the stuff we hear in AA today. People bringing that shit to the table. That's what they discuss. That's what we hear. And that's a culmination of years and years and years of that stuff, of not qualifying people properly, sending the wrong people to Alcoholics Anonymous, because the first obligation you have when somebody comes in is making sure that they're one of us. Because your message that you're going to carry won't work on somebody who isn't. Why won't it work on somebody who isn't? Because they won't do what we need to do to get sold or stay sold. And, and, and the stuff in the, the, the world, the clamor, is the stuff that we can get past. It's over and over and over again. Stuff that we want and we need and we think we want and need. We can get past that stuff with his, with God's help. So there's lots of reasons to trust God. Lots of reasons to trust God. Uh, I'm not going to say any more about that. I'm going to keep it that. I mean, I really have tons of more references for you. But I, you know what? I'm just going to say it. So the how of it is what? What do we talk about when we talk about the how? How do we trust God? Let me just find this here. I'll take it for five, ten minutes, and then we're taking a break, right? Okay? Uh, we know the story about Bill and Abby sitting at the table, right? Remember when Bill came and he thought his gym was going to outlast his ranting, and, and actually Abby did no ranting? I heard a little bit of a spin or a little bit different version of that. Uh, the book is very elegant, and what it says is just something like, uh, uh, Bill, it's sort of, Abby said I found religion, and Bill had started to shoot down all, oh, here we go, you alcoholic crackpot, you know, my gin will hold it a lot longer than your religious ranting, and he started mocking Abby, he really started mocking him, and the book says, my friend suggested that was seen a novel idea, he said, well, why don't you choose your own conception, and that sounds really nice, we read that in meetings, we talk about that stuff, that's not what I heard happen, I heard he said, why don't you use your own goddamn conception of job, Bill? They were buddies. And wouldn't you say that? If somebody, you're sitting there trying to bring something to somebody, he's slamming it back at you. And Eddie gave it to him with fervor. He gave it to him with fervor. 
and said that. And that's why it struck home to Bill. He didn't strike a casual like this, choose your own conception. God, Bill would have an argument for that. Debbie gave him a hardcore. And that's why I say, like, you can't, we'll, we, we're very gentle here. And we have a powerful, powerful message that is loving and gentle. But it's not always a gentle way in which we need to deliver it. Sometimes we need to be firm. Would you say yesterday, Kevin, I'd rather step on your toes than step on your grave? Is that what you said yesterday? Isn't that? I'd rather step on your toes than step on your grave. I'd rather hurt your feelings than, than, than watch you go and die or, 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 or believe that this stuff doesn't work. You know? <clears throat> He goes on to say it's only a matter of we're being willing to believe, right? Uh, page 13, he says, there, okay, now, so this is the how, okay? And I want people to play along with me here. <coughs> there I humbly offered myself to God. Anybody know what, was that? What's that sound like? Step three. Step three. To do with me as he would, I placed myself unreservedly under his care and direction. I admitted for the first time that of myself I was nothing. What's that sound like? That without him I was lost. Oh. Sounds like step two, maybe? Mm-hmm. Only a power greater than myself. I ruthlessly faced my sins and became willing to have my newfound friend take them away. Root and branch. What's that sound like? Six or seven? My schoolmate visited me. I had fully acquainted him with my problems and deficiencies. What's that sound like? Step four, step five, we made a list of people I had hurt and toward whom I felt resentment. Step eight, uh, the new God consciousness within, common sense would thus become uncommon sense. I was to sit quietly when in doubt, asking only for direction. Steps 10 and 11, as strength to meet my problems as he would have me. There's the how, okay, there's the how in Bill's story. And, and the reason that, and when, we, when I was pulling this stuff together, I wanted people to understand that the how and the why of Alcoholics Anonymous is run throughout our book. I mean, I, again, I have, like, the, the why was, was quite lengthy. Why we're instructed that we should do this, trust God. And the how is this is the how. It meant self-destruction and self, self-centeredness. And we have a way to do that. Um, for if an alcoholic failed to perfect and enlarge his spiritual life, so we have to perfect and enlarge our spiritual life. We have to begin to seek. It meant self, self, self-sacrifice for others. We have to start putting others' needs ahead of our own. And if you were at the meeting I was talking about last night, part of it was that, but we were talking about thinking about others. It doesn't say that I'm going to help others. It says our very lives as ex-problem drinkers depend upon some co- our constant thought of others because all we ever think about is us. And I owned the 97% yesterday. I said I was driving down here, and 97% of the trip, I was thinking about me. And the other 3% was I was thinking about dying because of his driving. <laughs> We were in a blizzard, and uh, that was about me too. So it says if we don't if we don't do this, we can't survive the certain trials and the low spots ahead, which is a why. Okay. Uh, I want to go into the, the, the solution. I'm sorry. I have to, you said thinking of others, but but you also said when I'm not feeling right, we have to go help others. Yeah. So help me understand that. Yeah, that's well, that's and that's. I want, like, when I, when I actually was talking last thing, you know, I gravitated towards helping others in my pocket, right? uh, because I was talking with my daughter, whom I was struggling with a great deal, and have been for a few years, and I know that she's one of the ones, she brings um, her own choice around drugs, and, 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 and her lifestyle brings a lot of pain and calamity to our, our life and our home, and I can walk in sometimes and, and uh, um, want to take charge. I want to control. I want to overpower because I see my wife's crying. She's shattered one more time. And I can't stand the pain. So I'll get a baseball bat and throw in my trunk. And I'm sober. Stone cold sober. Absolute lunatic. And I drive downtown and I start chasing people around in the streets looking for my daughter. And that's not what the book says. <laughs> that's not what the book says. I'm thinking about me there. I can't stand seeing my wife cry. My daughter is driving me nuts. It's it's all about me. And I can justify that stuff to the square, John. Oh, that's what I do, too. Oh, yeah, because she can. I can. Mm-hmm. You see? So it's, it's the constant thought of others. If I turn my thoughts to others, in my prayers last night, I was very mindful of that because it was a topic. I didn't know what I was getting into last night. I didn't drive all the way down and think I'm going to talk about one line on page 20. I didn't even know what the format of the meeting was. 
It was what came to me while I was sitting there very quickly. And I thought to myself last night in my prayer, is I started to think of some other people that had talked to me about being afflicted with pain. And, I, and immediately I began to feel better. Immediately I began to feel this sense of ease and comfort. Like I would if I'd taken a couple of drinks. The moment I turned my thoughts and my attention to other people, I immediately began to get this relief. Alcoholics are selfish and self-centeredness to the core. You know, people joke and say, I'm not much, but I'm all I think about. You know, <laughs> if you just go back in the last 24 hours, or the last conscious hour you've been awake, 7, 8 o'clock this morning, whatever, and think how much time have you divested in thinking about others. You know, you have to say, it'd be like this, you know, you got to sit over here and do this. And I don't know if you can all see it, but there's others. Oh, there's me. <laughs> Others, me. And you know what's really sad? Sad, but wonderful too. So I actually have to make an effort. It doesn't come to me naturally. A lot of women seem to come to naturally where they're putting other people's needs ahead of their own. It doesn't come natural to me. I need some, someone, someone owned that in the meeting last night too. They said, I'll do something for somebody else. As long as there's something for me. And I was pretty honest. But, that's the sort of, that's, that's the end. Helping others is, you know, we trust God, we clean house, we help others. The book talks about, in the helping others, why and how we have to do that. And that, that's a different animal. Thinking of other people all the time is different than carrying the message and helping other people. Like I was saying that, uh, there's a mealy mouth little whining guy, and he can hear the tape, his name's Vinny. Uh, <laughs> this, guy, this guy's had 19 he's had 19 sponsors in a year he's one of those guys you know and he's got because of texting and stuff three of his sponsors will be sitting in the same room getting texts at the same time about a new calamity so I told him one time I said you know buddy I, I just can't stand this man you're going to die you're going to die and you have to do something about this and he's crying and everything like that and he said well what am I supposed to do and we're talking about like we're going to talk about obedience here and what am I obedience to principles he said what am I supposed to do I said go down and scrape the corns off your granny's feet he lives with his grandma I said go scrape the corns off your granny's feet <laughs> that's how he reacted he said, I'm not scraping the corns off my granny's feet I said well, shut up and don't call me <laughs> if you're not obedient to spiritual principles if you're not ready to do something 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 for somebody else. I got no business with this. I, ha- I can't listen to this one more time about how terrible your life is and your granny sitting downstairs and you're upstairs drinking like her liquor. You know, like go down and do something for her. And that's all I meant was go and do something. You could have done dishes or something. That's a scrape of corn. Uh, let me just let me push right to one because. We go to page 25. I'm, I'm going to skip over a whole bunch of stuff here to get to, to the trust factors. We go to page 25, and we look at there is a solution. Okay? So I have this powerless problem. I need to access power. I need to access that power somehow. And through desperate means and desperate measures, I'm compelled to, to open my mind to the fact that maybe there's a possibility there. And on none of us, like the self-searching, the leveling of our pride, and the confession of our shortcomings, that's required for the successful consummation of this process. None of us like that. What is that? Self-searching, leveling of pride, confession of our shortcomings. What's that sound like? Step four and five? So we're not, you know, we're talking about spiritual principles in the steps. If you ask any old timer from the 60s back about what are the 12, or what are the spiritual principles of Alcoholics Anonymous, they'll say they're the 12 steps. They are one and the same to anybody who's been around here for a while. They are the 12 principles, the 12 steps. There's no, the 12 and 12 goes on to say that they embody spiritual principles, but any, you ask anybody who is around, they'll tell you that the 12 steps are the 12 principles. So we're moving towards a practice of spiritual principles in our life. They're going to relieve the obsession. We're going to do it through self-searching, the loving of pride, and, and confession of our shortcomings. And that's the how. And then on page 27, ideas, emotions, and attitudes, which are once the guiding forces of the lives of these men, are suddenly cast to one side. So whatever ideas, and this is an answer to your earlier question too, your earlier proposition, whatever ideas, you circle this and sure, whatever ideas, emotions, and attitudes you've got right now must be cast aside. They're the guiding forces of your life right now, and they can't be the guiding forces of your life. They need to be cast aside. And a completely new set of conceptions and motives begin to dominate them. 
Where do those conceptions and motives come from? The information that we're going to provide them. I don't know how you work with your person, but I'm going to get right into the third step, page 60 to 63. But then I'm going to get down on the knees and I'm going to say, everything you pitched at these goddamn problems is causing you this pain and this agony. Are you ready to let this stuff go and try this stuff? Because if you're not, if, you were, if you're postponing your third and fourth step, you're going to die. You're going to die behind you. You're going to die an emotional, painful death. And people won't want to be around you. They just won't want to be around you. You might not die physically, but you will die inside. And you'll wish that you were dead. So you need to take this. And these are actions that happen. And this is what I said earlier. This is rapid. This doesn't happen over 18 months. I wouldn't let anyone suffer for 18 months. I'd probably pull the plug myself. Like, I don't want people to suffer. I'll say, here's something that's going to help you right now. In a couple of weeks, you'll start to feel better. Oh, but the Children's Aid Society is taking my kids away. I get something here. If you do this in a couple of weeks, you're going to feel better. Oh, but my husband, he's, he's, he's just taking me some, some support and stuff. If you do this, it'll help you feel better. Oh, and that's about it. One more. Oh, then we're done. Okay, you need to get busy doing it your way. You need to get busy doing it your way. This is all we got. This is all we got. Try to sell somebody something else. They'll blame us for the, for the pain they experience. <laughs> Page 29. Referred to as clear-cut directions. Clear-cut directions. Okay, on page 29, clear-cut directions. And then I put a note here that I think that it's very important. And we go right from there to the third step prayer. <laughs> what page is the third step prayer on? So he provides what we needed. Okay, I'm going to trust God now, okay? I'm getting sold on this idea why I need to trust God. But I need to know how to trust God. I need to know how. And we're going to take faith, and we're going to combine it with action. And we're going to see the results. And we're talking about days and weeks. We're not talking about a lifetime. We're talking about days and weeks. And it says, he provided what we needed. He could solve those problems around the children. He could solve those problems around the, the bad relationships. He could solve the problems of no financial security. He could solve these problems if I kept close to him and performed his work well. What is his work? What's his work? What's his work he wants for us? Hmm? Help others. We know this, okay? And then we go on to, we were reborn. We have that attitude, something's changed. I'm following directions. I'm obedient to the process. I've only been with this sponsor for a few weeks, and I'm obedient to the process. I'm already starting to feel differently. I'm starting to think that maybe, maybe, the circumstances haven't changed at all. In fact, they've gotten worse. But maybe I can get out from under this. This has owned me for a couple of years, and maybe I can get out from under this. You guys join me? Will you join me in the third step prayer? So many of us said, as we understood, God... I offer myself to thee, to build with me and to do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me in the bondage of self, that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties, that the victory over them may be witness to the light of the help of thy power, thy love, and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. That is a commitment. That's a commitment to follow up with the rest of the steps. It's not that simple, but it's a commitment to follow up with the rest of the steps. When we look at that, we're asking for the relief of the bondage of self. Alcohol is not a problem today at this point. The obsession may still be on you. The, the desire to drink might still be there, but it's not a problem at this point. Your selflessness and self-centeredness is a huge issue, a huge problem. We're asking him to take it away. You take away my difficulties, the, ch the children's aid stuff and all that stuff, and I'll bear witness that it was you that did that. I will tell people, when I start feeling okay and settled about this stuff, I will tell people it was you that did that. When we confirm God in our lives to other people, God confirms his presence in our lives. It's that simple. It works both ways. And it's not, you can't just look at the good stuff that's happening in your life and say, well, thank you, Jesus, and thank you, God, and whatever it is. You've got to look at the bad stuff, too, and say, I'm growing. I'm growing here. This is all about growing. So that's what we get to. We get to that place. Now I want to go right to page 164. Two more minutes. Two more minutes. Only 164? Okay. It just says, God will determine that. See where it says that? It says, you must remember that your real reliance is always upon him. It's not upon things human. It's not upon a, a successful relationship or a financial uh, uh, position of, of, of security. Your reliance is always upon him. 
I got to tell you, when you look into the eyes of someone who hasn't really got it going on, like when you see joy and stuff come alive, and you see stuff in the, inside of them, that they're okay. They're okay with the circumstances the way they are. I am enamored with that. I'm blown away by that. Um, and then it goes on to say, he'll show you that how, to, how to create the fellowship you crave. And uh, one more piece. Page 567, if I have it in my book. It's in the spiritual experience today. Yeah, is that different page too? Yeah, the spiritual experience. Try, uh, try the spiritual experience there, mm-hmm. and look at okay, page five sixty-seven. It says, with few exceptions. You see that piece down the bottom? In spiritual experience, it says, with few exceptions, our members find that they have tapped an unsuspected inner resource. This is deep down inside each and every one of us. Unsuspected inner resource. You didn't know it was there. You didn't know it was there. It had never shown itself before. You can, you can rely on it. Like in Canada, we got these beautiful things called maple trees. And the way we get the beautiful, beautiful sweet syrup out of them is we drive a tap into the center of them. And slowly it trickles out. And it doesn't really amount to anything until there's substance there, until there's enough. And then if you just dip your finger and you taste it, it's sweet. It is beautiful, beautiful stuff. And so it says we tap this inner resource, and which they presently identify with their own conception of a power greater than themselves. You started now just through the process of trusting God to develop an understanding that you're going to know more about this power, and more will be revealed to you as time goes on. But you live in that place, and you do this through certain practices and, and through the steps, 12 steps. It's the, the whole essence of the program is driven by the fact that you've come to rely on this power. You know, and even in the fourth step, it says, when you're talking about fear and you're inventorying your fear, it says, we haven't, we, we've come to rely on this power. We, we trust God now. We think that this is a much better way in dealing with these fears, that we've come to rely and trust on this power. And that's what's happened by step four. So, are we going to just take a quick break? It'll take like, uh, I don't know how much time. Huh? Are you done? I'm done that first yet. Yeah, done the first verse. And without further ado, I'm going to bring up Marty. Well, guys, thanks so much for the feedback and uh, and, and everything in be- on the break. Um, it means a lot to me, not just that you're here, but also that, that um, you know, I don't think AA was ever meant to just be another meeting or another workshop or another. Or I, think, I always think it was meant to be an event, and I mean every single AA meeting. Uh, it's meant to be an experience. It's meant, to, it's meant to be something that happens to you that's different than 30 seconds before, and uh, and and that's my hope. And, and thanks for the people that gave me the feedback that that's, that that possibility has actually occurred. And um, what I, what I was talking about earlier was that Kevin was such a big help last night when we were looking at, at how I wanted to sort of approach this. And, and uh, you know, and the feedback is, you know, you don't need to be in the literature too much. Um, you know, uh, directed to sort of take you through the big book in three one-hour sessions. You've got your books, and some of you don't. And uh, so, yeah, maybe I won't, I won't stay in the literature at this point. But I also, you know, I want to make sure that you ask questions because you will drive the substance of what it is I'm talking about. Dr. Bob, the legacy that was left when, when he made that prescription and stuff like that, that carried on to a lot of the Cleveland boys, and, and, and it was a big part of what was happening. And, and uh, Franklin W. said it all the time, and uh, Searcy said it all the time. This was trust God, clean house, help others. If that would be the legacy of Alcoholics Anonymous, it would be permanent and left. We would try to mess around with a whole bunch of other stuff, but we couldn't get away from that. And if we open our minds up to the possibility that God can relieve us of the stuff that was killing us and destroying everybody in our wake, if we can open our minds up to that possibility, then we are ready to move forward. But we can't move forward if our house is not in order. We cannot move forward if we got muck and debris and all that stuff right in front of us. We can't. 
you know, and the reason that when a wonderful question was asked, what's your first name? Hi. Man, I'm taking out, Patty. So, <laughs> the reason that, uh, that we asked, uh, that we talked about it like that is because that's the kind of stuff that will block you. It's the kind of, and those are events and circumstances, but they're coming from somewhere inside. They're based on fear and resentment and all of that kind of stuff. And only God can remove that stuff. We've lived at the, at the, in our lives, in our childhood, we've lived at the, at the hands of that stuff our whole lives. And so, and we've tried to do things about it through therapy and through drinking. You know, through treatment centers and through drinking. And through some drugs and through some drinking. And we've tried to do something, but we always came back to the drink. The drink would always afford us some relief from all of that stuff that we're going to talk about now. And that's, I mean, that's just how it works, you know. And, and, and if any, anybody got any questions about either the first little bit there? And uh, how much time do I got? We got, it's 10 to 4 now. We are behind. Should I just go for about another 20 or 30 minutes? God will let you know. <laughs> Chris, <laughs> I'm going to stay to about the 40 minute mark at, at most, okay? Because, just because. Uh, I don't like going over. Um, go ahead. Tony, I call it Tony. Hey, Tony. For a while now, I've been working with my sponsor trying to find a higher power. And uh, I, I'm struggling with it. I'm doing everything possible that I can. I'm willing and stuff like that. And I'm having a tough time finding it. What do I do? Okay, so, and, and what may, I want people, that was a great question. I mean, it really is. And if you're still sitting here after that first little bit and you're asking that question, I need to clarify some things. This is about obedience. This is about obedience to spiritual principles. Whatever it is your sponsor is telling you to do is going to direct you towards a spiritual experience or that power. If that's not happening, and it's, is it, if, if the directions your sponsor is giving you are the steps, it's going to happen. We of like mind can guarantee that. If your sponsor is telling you to do something else and you're obedient to that process, something will happen. But if your sponsor is telling you to go to 90 meetings in 90 days, or if he's telling you to uh, don't drink and go to meetings, or if he's telling you to um, mow his lawn, uh, if he's telling you to do that shit, um, I can understand why your relationship with the power isn't sort of coming to you in a really sort of demonstrative way. But I also want to make that clear, too. I had had a vital spiritual experience in 1987, which I'll talk about tonight. It was profound, it was, it was immediate, it was very much like Bill Wilson's, and it changed my life forever. But that is not the experience that I'm involved in today. That is not, I had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps. You need to take the steps to get to God. And you don't need to be looking for Him. He's deep down inside you. You're going to clear away the bullshit that isn't God. You're going to clear away the stuff that isn't Tony. And you're going to find what's left there, and it's going to be this power. So there's nowhere to look. Sounds like you've been looking. You go through this process, and I, and I heard you say you took the directions. Take the directions, take the steps, clean house, and you will watch. This this will reveal itself. I, I assure you that. Keep listening to these tapes. Keep listening to these, these, these the people around you. Keep listening to your sponsor. That's really what it's about. It's about obedience to the process. Thanks for asking that, Tony. Uh... So no other questions about that. We said the third step prayer. When we get in that position of the third step prayer, we're putting ourselves before um, the change. We're putting ourselves right to I come, I'm powerless, I need power, and I access that power through the third step. That, that's my reconciliation around alcoholics and others. It's about surrender. It's about desperation. It's about a need. And something has to give. I cannot stay the way I am and expect to have a different life than I have. That's just the bottom line. And that's what a lot of people think, is they think they just got to stop drinking and their life will improve. I don't know about you, but when I stopped drinking, my life got worse. And that's the difference between an alcoholic of our type, a real alcoholic, and that's what they call them in the book 15 times, they call them a real alcoholic. That's the difference between that person and a problem drinker. Problem drinker stops drinking, their life gets better. Real alcoholic stops drinking, and it gets real bad. You become restless, irritable, and discontent, which is a very mild form of saying, you're just sort of slowly homicide. You know? You're standing in the line. You're only three people back, and you want to kill the people in front of you. And it occurs to you, and you laugh, and go, oh, that's crazy. But it occurred to you. you know, if, you're, if you're living in the sunlight and spirit, guess what? It doesn't necessarily occur to you. You actually start chatting to the person in front of you. Now, we have a way out in Alcoholics Anonymous upon which we can all agree. And it's this way. So I, I'm, those first three steps take me to a place that i got to make the change. 
You know, and I say, you take away my difficulties, I'll tell people it was you that's doing them. And then it says, that decision that I made in the third step is not going to have any lasting effect at all. It's not going to matter that I made that decision at all. Okay? I, I, all I'm doing in that third step is I'm making a decision and saying a prayer. I'm going to try and live this way. Like Tony's talking about, I want to live this way. That's what I want. I want this power in my life. I'm going to make the decision to go for that power. And then I have to do what's done next. And the first of which is to face the house clean. Face the, a, a strenuous effort at cleaning up the wreckage of my past. A strenuous effort at looking at the things in life that are blocking me. In my heart that are blocking me. In my mind that are blocking me. I've got to look for those things. I have to identify them. I don't have to really sort of be uh, uh, deeply introspective. It's just a fearless and sur- thorough searching inventory, so it's, it's got to be pretty deep. But I don't have to know, Freudian-like, what all of this shit means. I just have to follow the direction. And i got to tell you, when I was getting sober, there was a, a treatment center in Buffalo called Brian Lynn, and there was a, they had a Brian Lynn four-step inventory guide. And there was there's tons of inventory guides. You punch in four-step inventory in Google, and you'll get 9,000 hits. 9,000. And I told you my experience when I looked at this inventory here. I, that's so lame. That can't possibly work for another like me. It can't. You know? So this Brian four-step inventory guide, uh, I looked at this, and it was like, uh, childhood was like 95 questions. Uh, adolescence was like... You know, 142 questions was three parts. Adulthood was about 365 questions. Like, like have I ever fantasized about my dog? And uh, uh, have I ever heard my parents having sex? And inventory all of your thefts. Any thieves in the room? <laughs> Can you imagine? And that's what it said. Inventory all of your thefts. So several months after I started writing, um, I got a little black dial phone, and I got this Brightland four-step inventory. I got, I got my trusty 12 and 12, and I'm having at it. And I got a mess in front of me. And every time I hit something that stings, I call my sponsor at that time, who's given me these directions, because he didn't have the directions himself. I walked up to him at 18 months sober, and I said, Hey, man. What's this four-step thing everybody's, you know, talking about that's so terrible? He said, oh, he said, it's time, son. And I said, for what? He said, it's, you know, I'm waiting for you to ask. And I said, well, okay, well, let's take it at. That's it. I told you about my experience. There was no book. There was no people taking the steps. That wasn't, that was not the norm. And I went to meetings all the time. I was in AA. I had service positions. I had... Uh, I ran the group that I belonged to. I had closed meetings, uh, tons of open meetings, loved open meetings where I could talk about whatever the hell I wanted to talk about. <laughs> I loved that. I could talk about my private and four-step inventory guy. <laughs> All I wanted. God, talk about the dog. You know? I, it was great. You know? I talk about child, the child within, the John Bradshaw child within. Like, do you need to cuddle your little child within? <laughs> my child within needed his ass kicked. And I'm talking about that. I knew more about the family <laughs> disease of alcoholism than I ever needed to know. At open discussion meetings. I thought it was okay. Multiple personality disorder. Uh, uh, false memory syndrome. These were all real catchy AA topics at, in the 80s and the 90s. They really were. Like it, was, it was awful. And it was to be survived. Yeah. It's no wonder that I was one of hundreds of people that are still sober today. It is no wonder. You know, when they talk about statistics, I did for a few years. I get tired and, and flustered over it because I think it's worse than 5%. You know, I really do. I really do. And, and because I look around at the people in 1987 that get, were around when I got around in the same meetings I was at, they're either smoked out the whole time they've been sober, or they've been drunk uh, in and out, or they've been they're dead, or they got, you know, they're not around. Anyway. So that's my Bryland four step inventory, guys. <laughs> And then my fifth step experience was going in that car with him and driving around and talking about it. Now, I believe that that was very helpful. You know? And he was just a listener. He drove, I talked. I didn't have an inventory to read. I just hit something in my inventory and I talked to him about it. And I told him things that I would never tell another person. And I'm going to tell you something. There is something spiritual in that. There's something spiritual in the practice of confession. It's why it's one of the principles in Alcoholics Anonymous. In all theologies, and in all religious practices, in all spiritual practices, confession is a part of it. And what I was laying on this guy was a confessional. You know, I was embarrassed and ashamed to talk about this stuff, but I would do it with him. And he never hurt me with it. He never hurt me with that stuff. He just listened. He just drove. He never judged me. And even if he did, he never told me he did. And so something happened. Something happened. You know, something was happening in my life. I didn't know anything about, you know, when I talked, I didn't know anything about the second step, the third step. I did that four step right inventory and I drove around with him. And there's my sobriety. And step 12. 
I got all of that beautiful stuff <laughs> in step 12. All the change in Alcoholics Anonymous occurs in between steps 4 and 9. If I am this person, what it was like, steps 4 and 9 to 4 to 9 is what happens. That's the whole part of my story that was never there, and I spoke at conferences, and I spoke all across the country, and I've spoken. That was my, I had no, what, what, I don't have no, what happened. Nothing. I could make up shit. <laughs> Which I did, you know, sometimes for two hours at a time. You know, I remember my first speaking experience was six months sober because I got a big mouth and, and, and I had a great big cigar. I had a Cohiba cigar. You could smoke it in the 80s at that time. So I had this great big fat Cohiba cigar. And two and a half hours later into my talk, you know, I got my hair all slicked back. I got my zoot suit on. I got a bowl of tie and an orange shoot. And I, was, I had tons to say. I talked about crime. I talked about all kinds of jails and institutions. And I go down and say to my sponsor, I said, so, uh, what do you think? He says, I think you look like a movie star, son. And I said, and his face was red, like he was like this. And I said, a movie star? Who? Like Al Pacino? He said, no, Lassie, taking a shit. <laughs> he says, you're not allowed to say anything at meeting, ever, ever, again. The very next meeting, we're sitting at a meeting beside me, and the, the chairperson says, you a young man, have you got anything you'd like to say? He said, he's got F all to say. <laughs> like that. And I didn't talk at meetings for months. And probably was one of the best things that ever happened. It wasn't just because I learned to listen. It was because I needed to hear what you guys had to say. Even if it was all weird and askew and John bradshaw -ish, I just needed to hear what you guys had to say. You know? So those were my experiences. Now rifle through this really quickly. We look at this inventory stuff, so we need, to, we need to clean house. We need to get rid of this debris, but we don't even know what's there. We don't even know what's there. And I'm not really good cleaner in life, you know, like metaphorically. I don't know why it's like really that much to clean. I always am clean around me and all that stuff, but it just comes naturally. This stuff, much different. Much different. It says we set down on paper. We know for sure that we have to do this stuff with paper. We, I, a lot of my four-stepping was in my head. We need to do this stuff with paper, black and white, pen and paper. And it gives us specific directions in this book for a reason. It says we're going to look at, re we're going to look at resentments, fear, and sex conduct. Why those three things? Does anybody know? Does anybody know why those three areas? It's why I looked and I said, how lame is that? How lame is that? I even looked up what resentments were. Why, why those three things? Does anybody know why? Because it hits all of our basic instincts. Those three areas of our life hit all of our basic instincts. Our need to procreate, our need for security, and whatever else it does. I don't know them all. It hits all of our basic instincts. The society of our fellows, to be one in the society of our fellows, it hits them all. And that's why those areas covered when you follow the direction. So the first thing, anybody got any questions about that? Four step? Anybody not done a four step? Really important to hear. You never know. Okay. So then I'm just going to go through the directions. The directions are really specific. So the first direction is we set these things down on paper. What do we set down on paper? Grudges. We make a grudge list. We got a piece of paper. It's blank. We just start writing. Anybody sore, hurt, burned, third, threatened, pissed off, angry. Anybody who stepped on our toes, we just jot our name down. Boop, 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 boop. I don't know. People could do it right now, and it might take a few people three minutes. It might take other people many, many hours. You know, <laughs> it depends on how open and honest you are about this. I say to my guys, you take a little, one of these little things you carry around with you for a couple of days. That's all you got. You're gonna carry around for a couple of days. You're gonna make a list of person that you got a grudge against. That you sore, hurt, burned, angry, threatened, pissed off. Anything I say comes out of here. I don't make this shit up. It comes out of here. That's my grudge list. Then I said to these columns, and if I had a thing here, I'd show you how simple this is because people won't do it for a long period of time, and I know even the people in here who have done it. It took them some time to do it because they thought it was going to be some big thing, and that's my experience. That is my experience. I did the first four step that I did. I'll talk about it tonight. Uh, it was many years later. It was many years later doing it this way. So I look at my resentment. So I got this grudge list. I plug them in. I'm resentful at the cause. This is what they did. That's not hard. We know this. We know why we're pissed off at them. We can tell you why we're pissed off. We'll listen. To, we'll tell anybody who'll listen. You know, we know why we're angry. This is the cause. This is what they did to me. This is what happened. This is you know, my third grade teacher. Ooh, you know, my whatever. This is what they did. And then I say, how does that affect me? And everybody, when they look at that, and, and nobody ever gets it. And we have a really cool thing here. But I say, well. You don't have to come up with that on your own. You, you don't actually have, because I'll ask them and they'll get real Freudian on me. Really, you're, you know, like early childhood shit. You know, it's like they get really weird on me about, you know, well, this affected my, you know, just stop it. Okay, 
The areas of your life are defined here. You have multiple choice. It affects my self-esteem, my personal relations, my pride, my pocketbook, my ambitions, whatever else. It's in here. Okay? For the purpose of time, I'm just going to blast through this. So you just, does it affect these areas? Yes, yes, yes. Check, check, check. Or self-esteem, personal relations. I ask my guys to write it down. That's what you do. Then it goes into this other place. Remember I said it, was, it turns to text? The way we look at our lives in, resent, in, a, in the resentment way is we always only look at from that angle. I know this stuff. I know this stuff, Marty. There it is. I've seen it my whole life. It's what's driven me. Ah, and see, if you look at this, that's, that's all it shows. That's the angle we're looking at it from. Then the book says, no, let's try and look at it from a little different angle. Let's just go over here for a second and look at it from a little different angle. Can we perhaps see these people as spiritually sick? That's the question. That's the question. Can we perhaps... See these people as spiritually sick. I'm angry at my mother. Why? Because she just bitches and complains all the time. How does that affect me in personal relations, my self-esteem, my pride? No. Can I perhaps see her as spiritually sick? I love my mother. She's an angel. She's, can I perhaps, perhaps see her as spiritually sick? Perhaps I can. She's a very sad, self-pitying woman. Yes, you know what? Yes, perhaps I can. I'm not just condemning her to being sick. Perhaps. Check. It's, how can I be helpful to this person? God, save me from being angry. I do a four-step prayer, the sick man prayer. Put the person in the bed. Can I perhaps see them as spiritually sick? Absolutely. And then the last part is the part that people get stymied by. When I first was doing the work with my guys, I put my part. And that's a very common thing in Alcoholics Anonymous is that that last comment was, what's my part in the resentment? It's not what our book says. It doesn't say that anywhere in our book. And I did it for many, many years. And this is why these truths get, keep coming and getting revealed. This tape will be old hat five years from now. I'll have some whole completely different way of living five years from now. <laughs> but what it is today, current, right now, is that that last column says, my mistakes, my faults. So when I say, uh, I'm resentful at my cousin, uh, the cause, because he stole my dirt bike, it affected my personal relations, my pocketbook, um, can I see him as spiritual? Yeah, he's a goddamn thief. Sure, I'll see him as spiritual. Say, God save me from being angry. My mistakes, my faults. Well, I didn't do anything to him. I talked shit about him at family reunions. Um, that's about it. And the guy that's working with me says, well, no, 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 no. He stole your dirt bike. Yeah. Putting it on our minds the wrongs that others have done us resolutely look for our mistakes. Have I ever stolen? Well, I've never stolen anybody's dirt bike. No, I've never stolen. Looking for the wrongs. Well, yeah. Yeah, I, I've stolen a time or two. <laughs> Bobo, Bobo, Bobo. Welcome to the fourth step in the door. Welcome to the fourth step in the door. And really quickly, really quickly, I hope I can run to this really quickly. I'm eight years old. And when I was growing up in our neighborhood, Canada is still one of the safest countries in the world to live. The neighborhood I grew up in, we had a candy man. This candy man was named Mr. C. And Mr. C would give gumballs and black balls and, and licorice and to all the kids coming home from school. Lovely man. Well, hi, Mr. C. Well, here you go, kids. You know. So I became in the habit of going there on a pretty regular basis. And one day he invites me in and I come in and he touches me. He assaults me. I'm resentful of Mr. C. Cause? He molested me. He touched me. He sexually abused me. How'd that affect me? Jesus Christ, you can hear a pin drop in here. <laughs> I'm making this up. Okay? How did it affect me? You guys answered. Did it affect my self-esteem? Yes. Did it affect my personal relations? Yes. Did it affect my sex relations? Yes. Pride? Yes. Pocketbook? Yes. Whose inventory is it? Maybe it did, maybe it didn't, right? And my security? Yes. Yeah. Bang, the guy got the trifecta, right? Boom. I look at it and I say, okay, can I perhaps see this man is spiritually sick? Yes. Not an issue. Check. God save me from being angry. No. Let me be of help somehow, some way. Save me from being angry so I can be of help. My mistakes, my faults. Play along with me now. What did I do to him? What did I do to him? Carried it for years? What else? Well, you guys don't know this about me. 
but I became a criminal, a violent criminal in my life. A violent criminal, any violent criminal will be a predator. What did the guy do to me? He preyed on me. Agree? I preyed on people. Anybody in here ever? And, and you don't have to raise your hand. But have you ever manipulated anybody? <laughs> you know? This guy manipulated me. I was vulnerable. He manipulated me. You see what I'm saying? It's a whole new way of looking at things. This is a whole new inventory. I'm looking at it over here before, and I got therapists going, you poor son of a bitch. <laughs> I'm bringing it up in therapy. You know, you guys are going, oh, my God, I had a drink too, man. Jeez, that's awful. Some of you are identifying with me because this happens to a lot more people than, you know, we know. <laughs> so I have to go over here and I have to look at it from a completely different angle because that's what the book tells me to do. And when I get over here, I start to see my mistakes and my faults. It doesn't mean where was I manipulative to him. Have I ever manipulated anybody? I ever conned anybody? Have I ever lied to anybody? Have I ever hurt anybody? In my acts of violence, you see, what happens to a young boy who gets hurt like that is he starts thinking that he did something that made that guy think it was okay to do that to him. What was I sending out? And I became the man of men. I'm jumping through windows. I'm smashing guys in the face, meeting them, getting to know them. Because I need to send out a message that that shit don't happen to me. There's nothing wrong with me. And that's how it looks in my life. And I come up with a whole list of stuff. It says, putting out of our minds the wrongs others have done us, Mr. C gets crossed out. Where were we at fault? What could we have... You no, know, that's what it looks like. See what that last column does? See what that last column does? How free do you want to be, Tony? How free do you want to be when you're inventorying this stuff? How free do you want to be? I'm looking at this stuff in black and white. It's all going down on paper. That's the four-step inventory, in my estimation. January the 19th, 2014. What I will say to somebody often in that case particularly is get a dictionary and get your definitions and look at them. Uh-huh. And put them on your documentation. Whatever it is that you're writing, put them on there so you can see them in black and white too. But in this particular regard, personal relations for me refers to trust. That's what it refers to. Does it impact the way I relate with other people? Holy shit. You know? Really? Like, it's there. Personal relations, absolutely. Sex relations, did it impact the way I was involved in people in an intimate way? Absolutely. Absolutely. The sex relations piece is, is more just about how you interact with the other sex or, or, or interpersonally or in, intimately with people. Can you get connected? I couldn't get connected. You know, so I hit, I hit them all, you know. So that's, that's kind of how I work. The pride is about how do I see myself, right? How do I see myself? So there's, a, you know, you look up the definitions and you, you put them in and you see what works for you. But they're, they're, they are pretty straightforward when defined clearly and then they work. And, and guys, stepping outside of this process, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with stepping out of this process. You look at the incident that I'm talking about. Some might think that I need a lot more healing or, or stuff like that in order to sort of manage that set of circumstances. But the bottom line is, is that first AA, first the fourth step, first this, then that. If you need to go for therapy, if you need to get this stuff worked on, by all means, you go. This is not going to cure it. We are house cleaning you know, sometimes shit needs to go to the curb when you're house cleaning. We're house cleaning. We're looking at what's there. We're looking at our stock and trade. We need to see what's there, what's blocking. You think that stuff blocked me off from the sunlight of the spirit? You think as a young man, in my adolescence, in my young adulthood, that that stuff would block me off from the sunlight of the spirit? Absolutely. Absolutely. I work with a lot of men, and I see how it works. And when they're free of that stuff, the sunlight starts creeping in. It just starts creeping in. And they want to tell people. And they start the worst goddamn thing, excuse my language, that has ever happened to them becomes their best asset. Because they see some schmuck in the corner who can't get sober. Because you bastards don't understand. Easy for you to get sober. Look, you want to know what happened to me? I'll tell you what happened to me. And you're sitting there and you're going, yeah, I know. It happened to me too. You want to be free of it. You want to be free. And you move forward. That's the magic and the power of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's the magic and the power of cleaning the house. You know, I take this stuff and I've got it down in front of me in black and white. I got this stuff in front of me in black and white. And what do I do with it now? 
I set an appointment before I even started writing. I've asked somebody if they would listen to this fifth step before I even started writing. I go and I see that person. I sit down and I lay this stuff out in front of them. And however it is that they direct me to do it, I do a lot of fifth step work, guys. I have my way. But all I have to do is make sure that I get this stuff off my chest into the middle of the room so that we can get another dimension to look at it. Solitary self-appraisal seldom suffices. I think seldom is an understatement. It never suffices. Me looking at my problems has never worked. Us looking at my problems, uh, there's a third perspective. Now it looks a hell of a lot more real. There's a new dimension that's been added to this process. I don't need your feedback. I just need your eyeballs. I just need your ears. Feedback is always good, and if you get good at doing fifth steps, feedback's magic. People will tell you that, that they have an experience in this step that they hadn't had ever before in their lives. It's the first time that I began to feel like I was getting close to the power. In fact, the first time, I definitely was feeling like I was getting close to another human being. It was the first time that I started to feel those feelings about there's a possibility here that I might just be able to pull this shit off. And all I've done is put it on paper and share it with another human being. I haven't fixed anything. I'm no therapist involved. No, no, no treatment. I haven't done anything. I've just done what I've been instructed to do here. And it's taken me all of about three weeks. Four weeks. You know what I'm saying? So then I, what am I, what am I to do then at that point? At the end of my fifth step, I'm instructed to do a couple of things. One is, is that I have to look back and at these first five proposals. Have I skimmed? Does it look solid? Have I done everything that I can do according to the book? Have I followed the instructions thoroughly? I go home and I take this hour and I ask God from the bottom of my heart to, to be with me in the, the next part of my journey and to and thank Him for, for allowing me to get this far already. I've already experienced the grace of God and we talked about that earlier. And oh, geezers refer to that as the pink cloud and all that stuff. You're supposed to be on that pink cloud. AA was always meant to be a pink cloud. It's supposed to be a safe place where we're happy, joyous, and free. That's what it's supposed to be. And when somebody's happy, joyous, and free, why would we ever say that that's something wrong with that? Or we'll wait till you do the four step. I had a sponsor say that to somebody. <laughs> you know what? When you're moving along in this process, in the sunlight of the spirit, you know and understand that to, to make this shift, to change, you have to, you have to experience some difficulties. But with us and with God, you are safe and protected. We've always, we already embarked on the process of trusting God, and now we're following His directions by cleaning the stuff up that blocks us from Him. It, her, whatever. So, <clears throat> I don't know, my voice is bad. Uh, rich alcoholic. Rich. Uh, Everybody in New Jersey named Rich? <laughs> There's three riches at the name of the I'm jumping ahead, but Mr. C, God bless of you. Yeah. Um, and when you get to your ninth step, you use your fourth step list. How would you make amends? By forget? By forgetting that guy? Given if I don't yammer on too much and talk too much, I'll, I'm going to touch on that. Okay. All right. I'm <laughs> because it's the same list, right? We end up with the same right. list. And I get there real quick. Because what are we going to talk about in step six and seven? Like, what are we going to talk about in step six and seven? You know, I'm asked in, in, to go home and take an hour. And I'm asked to look at, at what I've done. And I'm asked to thank God from the bottom of my heart. I take down my book and I look and I say, is everything in check here? Does it look pretty good? Have I done the things I've been told to do? At the best of my ability, here I am. Have I done everything I can? And then there's no delay. You know, the, the 12 and 12 says delay is dangerous, rebellion, fatal. This is a step that separates the boys from the men. What's the difference between a boy and a man or a girl and a woman? One's grown up and one's not. One's mature and one's not. That's the only difference. So this is what separates. Now we're going we're gonna to take the leap. And the only way we can take the leap in step six, it says we became willing to have God remove these defects of character. Do I want this stuff to stay with me? Do I want this stuff that I've just uncovered and, and discovered in my fourth step? Do I want that stuff to stay with me? Is this the kind of person that I can carry on with and be? Is this the kind of person I can develop? No. I want God, I, I want to be willing that that stuff be removed. And all I have to do in step seven is ask him. God, I have myself? No. What is it? How's it going? Huh? Right right to do with me as you will. That's the one. <laughs> you guys, I mean, I know I said I wasn't going to return to the literature, but just, just for evidence sake, just for evidence sake, I want people to know and understand that it takes longer to read this than it does to do it. The directions in step five at the end are step five directions. And then I get into step six. 
And it says, if we can answer to our satisfaction those questions asked about step five, then we look at step six. We've emphasized willingness as being indispensable. Are we now ready? Am I ready to have God remove uh, from us all the things that we have admitted are objectionable? So I admit they're objectionable. Not what I think God thinks are objectionable. I've admitted they are objectionable. Am I willing to have them removed? Can he now take them all, every one? That's a question. Answer it. Sure. If we still cling to something we won't let go, we ask God to help us be willing. So I'm not even thinking anymore. To be honest with you, I'm just going to tell you my experience, even sitting here right now taking a step essentially with you, is I'm not even thinking anymore about what those defects are. I just know that there's a whole heck of debris there, and I'm not going to cling to anything. You know what? Take it. Because I move to step seven and says, when I'm ready, okay, yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready. We say something like this. My great, I'm willing you to take all of me, good and bad, good and bad. Why good and bad? I don't know the difference between what's good and bad. I don't know what's a defect and what's an asset. I just don't. You, I'm willing to have you remove everything that I find objectionable. But now at this point, I'm going to take the judgment out of it for me. I can't have the judgment. It's got to be removed. It's good and bad. You take it all. I'm going to be a blank slate. Pray you now remove from me every single defect of character which stand, which causes me pain? No. Which stands in the way of my usefulness to you and my fellows. This is the first sort of information that everything we're doing here, everything we're doing here has been aimed at being of better service to him, to our fellows. And then grant me strength as I go from here to do your bidding. We've then completed step seven. It takes longer for me to read it than it does to do it. I've done step six and seven. There are people that will hover on that step, those two steps, for years. Because how's it going? Not bad. What are you up to? Working on my defects. <laughs> That's what you said six months ago, working on you. What, what, are, you, what are you coming up with? I, you know, I just uh, trying to do my anger control therapy. and uh, you know, I, <laughs> That's not what it says here. It's not what it says here. We're not to work on our defects. You'll hear people say, I'm trying to be more honest. Good luck with that. Yeah. I'm just saying, <laughs> you ask God to remove your dishonesty, and you watch what happens. You become conscious. Because you're going to... Tony, you're going to move into the more into the steps, following the directions, and you get a God consciousness that already sort of tweaks you when you're being a little dishonest. <laughs> you know, I was saying the other day, oh, I'm just standing out shooting shit with somebody, right? I remember Earl talking about this, Earl Hightower. And uh, I just totally made something up. Ah, I got a 72-inch musky there about three months ago. <laughs> it was like out of my mouth, and I'm like, uh, guys, that's all bullshit. Uh, <laughs> I have no idea why I said that. I wasn't even fishing three months ago. Um, I guess I just need to keep in practice <laughs> in case I ever drink again. <laughs> but there's these little nudges you get. You get these little nudges, right, where, where you know your defects are bing, boom, ba. Your shortcomings are just, you know, shortcomings, if you think about it, I think uh, I heard a bunch of definitions of this stuff, but if you think about a short this is not quite there, right? So it's, it's, it's a, a departure from the ideal. If I want to live by spiritual ideals and spiritual principles, honesty, faith, hope, dependence, courage, integrity, if I want to live by those ideals, this is a place where I got the measuring sticks. The shortcomings is how far away from those ideals am I? You know, how was my day today? When I reconcile my evening tonight, I'll look back on this day and I'll think to myself, where am I at? And my shortcomings will be obvious to me. You know, tomorrow maybe I could just be a little bit on, more honest. Tomorrow maybe I could just be a little bit more faithful. Tomorrow I could just have maybe just a little bit more integrity. And that's how this works for me in step six and seven. Take no place for me to hover here. There's no place. And it says now we need more action. There's no more sitting around. You don't get to sit around six or seven and hover. Working on your defects. There's no place to stick around. As soon as I've done that step hour and step five, I ask God to remove my defects of character and shortcomings. And then I do step eight and nine. I got my list from when I had that last call and a whole bunch of names come up and all kinds of shit that I'd lied and manipulated and stolen and hurt and preyed upon. And I was, you know, you heard me, right? It was like, I got this huge list of, of names and I got another, I'm going to make another list. It said we had it and we took, it's not, it still says we make a list. You could God be the one you got in the four, but I still, I tell my guy, make a list. And some other things seem to pop up. You know, where I stole some money from a company or something like that. They just seem to, that's what happened not that long ago either. I'm 26 years sober and it was like, holy shit, really? You know, I hear about this happening. I hear Charlie with the dirt bike thing when he was walking by the golf course. I hear those stories and I think, nah, no, nah, I'm good. <laughs> I've been walking down a road and I'll see a, uh, uh, someone, this is what happened. Was you know how well, you guys probably don't have a problem down here, but you know how windshield wipers um, they freeze. Do you guys have that problem down here? <laughs> of course you do. 
Um, so I see this windshield wiper up, and I thought about my working in Trident, and I remembered a theft that I had committed that I had never made amends for. That wasn't that long. That was a couple months ago. That, that, that's what happens. You, you know, that, that's how it works for me. It's like, oh, really? Like, knock it off. You know, I had memory damage in April. Couldn't you just let that one in there? I mean, it, I, I, I'm forgetting shit I should be remembering. Where's that coming from? You know? um, like my wife's name and stuff. But, okay, so we make this list. We make this list. And willingness at this point is huge. And the spiritual principle is outlined in my estimation. This is my estimation only. This isn't you know, This is an opinion. It's not. Is brotherly love. When I approach this eighth step, it's about getting right with the world. It's about taking away all the sort of stuff inside of me that blocks me from you. Whether you're a woman or whether you're black or whether you're tall or whether you're short, whether you're old, whether you're young, whether you're in the states or you're in Canada, whether you're. Uh, uh, a Toronto Maple Leaf fan, whether you, it doesn't matter. I have to drop the, a Ravens fan. Well, you just have to drop this uh, stuff that's in between me and you. And my willingness to do that, I believe in Marty Cosgrove's sober life has been the greatest gift that I've ever received. Is that whatever distance was between me and other people um, is gone. It's gone. And... Uh, I probably won't talk about this thing, but I'm the godfather to, to several children. I have four daughters of my own whose, whose friends and, and are, are my friends. I have, um, I don't know how that happened. My, I became the go-to guy in my family. I was the bane of their existence. I was an embarrassment. I was the guy who was in the newspaper. I was the guy they denied knowing. And I became the go-to guy. I was the guy that held on to both my parents as they slipped away into the great abyss. I was the guy that got the, the executorship and, and, and ran the, the, the... I was that guy. How does that happen? How does that happen? The eight step is how it happens. We don't, it doesn't look like there's a link, but there's a link. Whatever it is that my, my old man and me, whatever it is that's in between us is gone. I'm going to be willing to have it gone, and it gets removed. It gets removed. It's not just because I asked for it to be gone. It's because I was willing to take the actions in the ninth step. We made direct amends wherever possible. Amend means to change, to alter, to repair. That's what it means. It means to make right whatever thing is wrong. I have a responsibility in any defective relationship to make it right, to make it comfortable, to make it safe, to make it okay. That's with my ex, who hates my guts. Because I'm so wonderful. I know it sounds I know it sounds ridiculous, but it drives her crazy. She people tell her, Oh, how did you ever let him go? And she just wants to die. She wants to kill me. And I'm not saying that. I say I was thinking about it the other day. I was thinking, you know, I, I said to somebody else, I said, I get along with everybody in the world pretty good. You know, I, I work hard at that and I, I I'm very pleased with that. And if I don't, I'd like to repair that. I don't know how I'm going to get past that. She wants really badly to hate me, and she can. Because when she sees me, she, she smiles, and she, she just can't. She says, it. I hate liking you. <laughs> she says, this is the mother of my youngest child. And, and, and it's, it's, like it's, it's a wonderful place to be where uh, uh, I set about, like I had this list of names. And, and it became prioritized. It was very important for me to sort of clean up the stuff that was closest to me. I'm going to talk about this really quickly, then we'll break it, and I'll stop, because I want, I want people to understand, and I'm no different than any other guy or gal that are trying to get sober here. I try to find ways around everything, and my mind is successful at doing it. It's very successful at doing it. And I can go to meetings, and I can be that sponsor, and I can be that guy that's telling you to do every single bloody thing I tell you to do. But I had middle-of-the-road recovery offered to me when I got here, and when I was in this nine-step process... Uh, I had actually taken the initiative by myself. I had a sponsor who was who was much more inclined. And this is my second sponsor, Tom Hayes. He's passed away. This him right here. He was uh, much more inclined to sort of work with me through some of this this later stuff, these steps, because he believed in love. He believed that Alcoholics Anonymous and, and, and my children and my family and that it was about. He really. He, if you'd asked me at that time in my sobriety what Alcoholics Anonymous is all about, I'd have told you love. When I first came here, it was about not drinking. And then I was around here for a little while, and I, I realized, no, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. It's all about love. 
And that was from this sponsor who took me through this change process, four through nine. And it's, it's not unusual or, 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 or silly to think, because that's what I evolved toward. I wanted to give and receive love, and this process of change, that's what it was driving me towards. I totally agreed with him. He said that's what AA was about. I agreed with him. Then I found out a few, a couple of years, a few years later, it's not about that at all. It's not about not drinking. It's not about love. It's, it's about God. And I stayed there for about five or six years, and that's what I tell people. Hey, it's all about God. Hey, it's all about God. Yeah, I'll tell you where I am today, and like I said, five years, maybe it'll change. It's all about obedience. Obedience to these principles. Obedience to my sponsor. Obedience to my little girl who has a need. Obedience to my bosses. Obedience to, to the neighbors. Obedience to my life. Obedience to what's in front of me. Obedience to you. That's what it's about. So really quickly, um, I get to this place in my, in my amends, and, and, I, and I hit the head-on ones, the direct ones, the ones, and I'm down there, and I get my old man. And I'm not going to make amends to my old man. And I have reasons for that, and, and the justified reasons in my head. I couldn't ever make it work for you, because why would anybody want to be almost sober? Why would anybody want to make almost all of their amends? That's the feedback you were giving me. I'd tell you, shut up and walk away. Mind your own business. You know, that's what I would do. And I'd go on helping people and carrying a powerful, powerful message. Now, what happened was I got this old man who was, who was brutal. And, and uh, in his own alcoholism and his own hatred of self and his own hatred of the world, he was a brutal man. And, uh, and I loved him dearly. And I wanted him to love me, but that never happened. And I... Uh, his expressions of his his life were violent, and, and that's just the way it was. And uh, uh, I know that's not uncommon. I know that there's big end people in here that have that. So when I got sober, and and you know my old man never visited me in prison. He never he wasn't part of my life. When I I was on the street when I was 15. When I got sober, uh, uh, that was the one. I, and that, when I started doing stuff, that was the one I wasn't going to do. I get a phone call from my family that the old man had been drunk and he came around this corner of Burlington and he hit this tree and uh, he was dying and uh, the steering wheel across his chest and he was dead. He was not going to make it. And he was a mess. And uh, uh, I'll try to do this quickly. Um, uh, I'm, again, he gets flown to the Hamilton General Hospital, uh, airlifted. I'm the first one at the hospital. The cops are there and they say, can't tell whether it was a suicide attempt or not. There was no breaks and he maybe fell asleep, which is, he did that a lot. Fell asleep while driving. He, he did that a lot. And, uh, and I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm, I'm this far away. You know, I'm sitting there at the door, and I'm looking at him. I'm this far away. What's your first name, buddy? Mark. From Mark. I'm this far away. And I'm looking at my old man in the bed. And I'm just like this. And, and the cop's talking. I'm not hearing a word he's saying. And my head's pounding. And my, I, don't, I don't even know what I feel. And I go downstairs for smoking. Smoking in hospitals at that time in the little corridor rooms. And then you could smoke. And I'm sitting there puffing away. And then walks one of the Alcoholics Anonymous members in my area. And... uh he says, you know, I'm going to have to make that right. Eh? And I said, make what right? Shut up. Hey, you don't come in here. I'm upset right now. I don't need no more heat. Hey, shut up. A couple of days pass. He's still there because he's got a family member. And he said, how's that thing going? You know, that nine steps stuff. I said, why don't you mind your own freaking business? You know? And I'm there every day. My family's already calm, done their bit, and they've walked away. Now, a few days have passed, and he's hanging in there, the old bastard. Right? He's all hooked up. He's all wired up. He's got all these in the tent. And he's all, he's all. And I'm standing there, and I, you know, one day I, I just sort of, you know, I walk in like this, you know, I get about this close, right? And two days later, I get, you know, a couple steps closer. Four or five days later, I get right up beside the end of the bed, right at the end of the bed, and I'm looking at him. I'm looking at him for a long time. And one day I go and I sit in the chair beside him. I'm just sitting there and I'm looking at him. And a couple of days pass, and I reach over and I touch his hand. His skin is that paper thin skin, purple, blotchy. Paper thin skin. And I'm, this is the man I'm gonna be terrified of my whole life. And I touch his hand. I never touched my father. I felt that, but I never touched him. I touch him like that. <sighs> Nothing. A couple days later, I sit and I get a little bit closer. I'm sitting beside him. I'm looking at him. I'm looking at his nose hairs and I'm pulling on his nose hairs. And a couple days later, I'm lifting his eyelids and I'm going, you know, like <laughs> seven weeks later. I'm sitting beside his bed. I start crying. And I start looking at this vulnerable, vulnerable man. And I start to sob because I remember some of the things he had told me when I was a kid about his life. It was very, you know, it was, it was awful. And then I started to remember about the good things. I started thinking about 5 o'clock a.m. hockey practices 
when I would be asleep and I would feel his cold hand slide up underneath me, he would lift me quietly out of the room and put me on the couch and put me in my hockey gear and make me homemade hot chocolate on the stove and drive me to 5 a.m. practices. I started remembering that stuff. Stuff I hadn't thought about in years. And I became overwhelmed with, with grief and fear and, and, and pain. And I started to sob. And I started to tell him about where I had been and how much it hurt me for him not to come and visit me in prison. And there's nobody else around. There's nursing staff walking in and out. They gave us our privacy weeks before. And I'm holding his hand now, clutching it like I had known it. And it crooked my arm right in his arm. And I saw me. And at the end of it, I said, yeah, I love you, Dad. I've always loved you. And I looked over and his eyes were looking at me. go, I love you too. And then the bastard lived. <laughs> Did he live? You know? like, he didn't die. It was like, holy oh, shit. And when I saw it, it was like, now he knew that I knew that he knew, and I'd said the L word, and he'd said the L word, and it was like, oh no. You know? Now, he, it was a long period of rehab, but I was there every day. I was the guy holding him in the walker when he's doing this down the hallway. This is a, this guy's full of steel from our old earlobes. He's just a hardcore. He ain't going down at all without a fight. And to the day that he died in my arms, he, we were like this. And it's funny because because uh, when we would be to family functions and shit like that, he wanted to know how you guys were doing. Yeah, I would walk into the room at a Christmas gathering or something, and my brothers and the sister, they never got to make their peace with him. They lived with resentment till he passed and have it today. They can't hear me talk about my father. But I would walk into a room, and the place would be packed, and he could hardly move, but he would run to the door to get up and get on me. And he couldn't talk. Right? He was a screamer, right? God has a sense of you know, justice. He, he crushed his larynx, and he said, how's it going? How are them guys at the a and How's that going? You know, and that's and, and and he would ask about you guys because he knew what I knew is that I've never been better. I've never been a better man than when I'm with you guys, and I'm doing what you guys asked me to do for a life that I couldn't have ever dreamed possible. So that's an amend I wasn't going to make. Don't ever think you're not going to make the ones that you're not going to make. You'll be going around the corner with your grocery cart and you slam right into the son of a bitch. <laughs> and you're going to have to do something about that. <laughs> Thanks for letting me share. Uh, food in their belly, and uh, I'm going to go pretty quickly here, so don't fall asleep on me if you had a lot to eat. Um, I hardly got anything, but uh, <laughs> uh, that's okay too. It was really good what I had, so I want to thank everybody for preparing the food the way they did. What did you say? Uh, I don't need another meal, trust me. I've got my fair share. Um, so I left you off at that place, and I think, you know, we got we got a couple people here who are fairly um, uh, fairly new, and I want to tie something together. And Kevin reminded me, and we talked about it last night, and it's an important piece. If you've got your books, and uh, these are on the same pages, uh, turn to page 52. And in the other hand, I want you to turn to page 83. Yes. Okay, so you would kind of have your book in your hand like this, right? Okay, so I want you to just think about this, and we're going to tie, I want to tie the first nine steps together very quickly, and I'm going to talk about helping others through step 10. Okay, not through step 12, working with others, but rather I want to talk about how we move out of self and, and in, on a daily basis and into service to others. Uh, through step 10, and so I won't keep you that long. And I wanted to make this really clear. So, we're powerless. We need power. We access power through the third step. We, we've got blocks in front of us, so we inventory and we're going to remove those blocks to tell somebody else about this stuff. That's kind of how we get it off. We ask God back in to help remove these things, these defects, characters, and shortcomings we've discovered. And we start setting right the wrongs in our life. We start looking people in the eyes. We start paying back the money. We start doing those things. And we get to this place. Now, if you turn to page 52, and again, I want to think, I want you to think about the last very troubled day that you've had, or the day before you came into Alcoholics Anonymous, and I just want you to raise your hands and play along with me here. Page 52. We were having trouble with personal relationships. Huh? We couldn't control our emotional natures. We were afraid of misery and depression. We couldn't make a living. 
We had a feeling of uselessness. We were full of fear. We were unhappy. We couldn't seem to be a real help to other people. What these are referred to on page 52, if you haven't highlighted them or sort of underlined them yet, they're referred to as the bedevilments. These are the things that are involved in an alcoholic's life. Drinking or not drinking. Not sober or sober. 25 years in Alcoholics Anonymous. We had a speaker from Utica up to our, our area just a little while ago. Put a chunk in his mouth and blew the back of his head off. He didn't die. He's still walking around the AA talking about the story. But that's, that's untreated alcoholism. What you're looking at there in those bedevilments is untreated alcoholism. And that stuff can happen to you 20, 25, 30 years in sobriety. It can happen to you two days in sobriety or, or 20 years. I want, I took you through step nine and I want to just read this to you and I want to tell you, I want you to see if you, you see any similarities. If we're painstaking about this phase of our development which means the amends process, we're amazed before halfway through, and that means halfway through the amends. We're going to know a new freedom and a new happiness. Sounds a little different than the bedevilments, right? So all I've done now is move from page 52 or page 83. I've gone through the process of the fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh steps. I've made some amends in eight and nine, and this is what it said. New freedom, new happiness. We won't regret the past, but we will still shut the door on it. We're going to comprehend the word serenity, and we will know peace. No matter how far on the scale is gone, we are going to see how our experience will benefit others. All that debris and that wreckage, I'm going to start to see how this can be useful for me helping other people. Uh, the feeling of uselessness, which they talked about in the bedevilments, and self-pity is going to disappear. It's going to be gone. And self-pity is an ugly beast. You know, it's just an ugly beast. It's an ugly beast to be around, and it's just an awful thing. We'll lose interest in self-esteem, gain interest in our fellow self-seeking will slip away. That's not very therapeutic, is it? <laughs> like if you don't have a therapist that's going to go and drop $200 on the table and say, can you help me have self-pity, self-seeking slip away? Yeah, right. Like You're going to ask me, you're going to give you cognitive tests and all stuff. But this is, this is what happens in the spiritual world. One day you turn around and you thought, I just thought of somebody else. Holy shit. <laughs> that's what happens. And, and, and you think, that kind of feels really good. It does feel light about that. And so you want more of that. And that's what happens. We want more of this. If we want this life, we want more of this. Our whole attitude and outlook upon life will change. And that's why our perspectives change. You guys will hear me talk tapes and CDs. You'll hear me talk 10 years ago and I had the worst childhood you ever heard of. It was awful. You hear me talk now? It wasn't so bad. Hopefully 10 years from now I'm going to have this glorious childhood like David Cleaver. And what's changed? What's changed in my story other than my perspective? What has changed? I start to remember. I'm just remembering the fun times now when I was a kid. That cold we had, that bitter cold a couple of weeks ago, that's my element. I was I was reveling in the two feet of snow and the absolute cold, thinking about all the outdoor hockey games and stuff when I was a kid, playing in the snow. And wintertime is my favorite time of year. I haven't had a winter in 30 years. I haven't. Not like this. So, I uh, intuitively know how to handle situations with that. Well, that's because God is working in our life. That's because we now have a new director. That's because we have somebody now that's in charge, somebody else other than us. And that's why this stuff works. And I wanted to point that out, because I want that for you, Tony, is that you can see the bedevilment and you can see the promises. That's what's in between them. The directions. Nothing else. That's what's in between those two things. You get from that place to that place. That's the miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's the message we're meant to share. From this podium, at tables, and i got to tell you, if you're having a shitty day, and someone told you to go to AA and dump on the table that you've been lied to, that's, that's, that's not cool. You come to that meeting and you ask, is there anybody here who needs some help? Or you listen, because somebody else is also having a bad day. Your life will improve exponentially. You'll find somebody that will listen to your garbage. I mean, that's that's it's important that we do get this stuff out. It really is. But not not here. Our hidden up here is to help phone you and help people like that just come alive and maybe get a sense that this too can happen for them. That's our job. Okay, so like I said, uh, anybody got any questions about those first nine steps? I'm not going to do 10, 11, 12. I, I, I do see through prayer and meditation. Pretty self-explanatory. Prayer is your own prayer life, however you decide to do that. You build a structure around that. We have set prayers in this book that are fantastic, but you can go to the denomination the, the, the of your choice, and you can take stuff out of that. You can take spiritual readings. You can do whatever you want, but engage in the process of communication. The spiritual principle of that step is awareness and communication with God. It's being aware that there's a power alongside of you the whole way, that it's right there. When you're unaware, that's the unconscious stuff. Unconscious contact, conscious contact. You ever remember when you were out there getting hammered and all that stuff, and maybe even in sobriety, and, and you go, Phew. something was really looking out for me that day. You remember that? We hear those stories all the time. Looked out, saw my car there. I thought, oh, God was really looking out for me there. You know? <laughs> we, we hear that in AA all the time. That's called an unconscious contact. 
when we get to step 11 through the process of this work, it's a conscious contact. We know now where the power's coming from. We know what this is all about. We have conscious contact, and we need to keep it that way. I'm aware that as God is doing for me things that I could not do for myself. And that's the 11th step. Now, what happens is we're charged with the responsibility of working with others. We're charged with the thing, which I said was different than thinking of others. You agree, right? Working with others that we're charged with is taking this message, these 12 steps, and carrying this message to the alcoholic who still suffers. The guys I was talking about in my experience of experience in 87 was not a result of these steps. And they're really nice men that I was talking about. They're Christians. They go to church. They're beautiful men. They're beautiful men. I love them. But their experience, really, the spiritual experience, is not a result of these steps. So the message we need to carry is the message is a result of these steps. I've taken these steps. This is a spiritual experience I have, even if it's the Lord Jesus Christ is my personal Savior. And it's just still this, as a result of these steps, that's the message I would carry to somebody who's coming in. That's the message. As a result of these steps, having taken these steps, I have something to share that nobody else can share with another alcoholic. I, it's, it's kind of like the dubious luxury, but it's also the, because any time that I'm suffering, if I can find someone to help, I become free of the beast that's inside of me, which is me. The minute that I get outside of myself, I'm good. Okay? Uh, I told you I was looking through this, Davey. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. Okay? Not so fast. Not so fast? We have a meeting starting at what time? 6.30. Time's a 6.30 meeting start. (laughs) (laughs) I got 90 seconds. 5.25. You're good. Okay. It's not 5.25. 5.30. You have 45 minutes. Time's a meeting start. You have As God is my witness, I thought the meeting started in five minutes. Ah, let me backtrack here. <laughs> Step one, we... Uh... <laughs> um, okay, all right. I swear, I thought... I don't know what the hell I was thinking. <laughs> Let's talk about Step 10. Let's talk about step 10 from the perspective of um, um, having made a contact with the power. I, I've been exposed or it's, it's real, revealed itself to me in certain ways at that point. And now I'm still just following directions. I'm just following directions. And, and, and that is the, that's the most important thing of all is obedience to these principles. But I have, it, it says that we've now entered the world of the spirit. Uh, how do we know we've entered the world of the Spirit? We know we've entered the world of the Spirit because we look at those promises that just arrived, and some of them have come true. Not all of them, and not perfectly, but some stuff's happening to me that I had no... All I did was follow directions. I had no input on or plan about, but something's happening to me. That's the world of the Spirit. Something is different. And that's it. And you can tell when people are in the world of the Spirit. They have a look about them. They just have a look about them. They're a little bit more eased than they were a couple of months before. They're a little bit more... Uh, they're, just, they're just a little more at ease, you know? It's like when there's a new guy coming in and a new guy coming in and they got the weight of the world on their shoulders and it's like every little thing is just another thing that's added on. And then you see, they're free, you know? And their attention is turned towards others somehow. And these are all things that are really so sort of strong indicators that they've entered the world of the spirit. Um... So we're driven. We're driven into a place where the only the only thing left for us to do at this point. So we've, we've, we've been delivered. We've made amends. But we're in the process of making amends. And I'm not saying like that's the process. To me, that's the longest process in Alcoholics Anonymous. Is the amends process. That's the longest one. That's the one. That, but it's just while we're doing this, we embark on this work. We move ahead. We don't stop. We don't. We don't do wait until we do all of our amends before we do this. This is while we're doing this stuff, while we're engaged in this, this process of our recovery, this is what we do. We enter the world of spirit, and our next function of growth is grow in understanding and effectiveness. This means I need to learn more. So now we are talking about understanding. Now we are talking about comprehending. My plan here now is to go to meetings, to share, to take on new spiritual readings, <laughs> to spend time with people who, who are, have been around much longer than me, to pick their brain, to ask, to, to learn, to listen, to take the right position in humility. Nobody gets this stuff and just carries it with them. And nobody just stops and goes, oh, well, they do, but they're going to go for it. It's like, oh, okay, I, I, I've arrived, you know? I've arrived. i got to tell you, man, this, this is kind of how it works. You guys have, 
uh, you guys in the man in your midst that carries a very powerful message, Chris. And he's in the demand all over the country. And when he goes and he does all over the nation, he goes and he carries this message. And he carries it with depth and weight. And, and people understand it. And it drives people's enthusiasm. And that's what our job is. Chris is no different than, than Tony. He's no different than me. You know, he's no different than Jack. You know, he's no different. The idea is, is that he's, he, he has sort of cultivated a way of delivering this message with confidence that people look and say, I must have what he has. And your job is to get to that place as well. And how do you do that if you don't ask? If you don't talk? If you don't experience? And you go to these guys with sobriety and ask them, what was it like? See, I know everything there is to know about being 26 years old. Well, I have absolutely no idea what it is like to be 27 years old. None. None. I know what it's like to be three days sober. I do. Anybody here not know what it's like to be three days sober? Anybody here not know what it's like to be four days sober? No? So you, this is the idea. You gotta, you gotta get to this place where you understand where you're at. So it brings us to step 10. And, uh, work, the directions that we get here, and, and again, I want you to, I want you to sort of play along with me here because if, if if, if anybody asks me, or, which is an you, but if, if anybody asks me, I believe the essence of all good living is tied up right here in step 10. The way I need to live my life. When they were talking about living AA one day at a time, slogan one day at a time, it came out of here. It wasn't not drink one day at a time, it was living one day at a time. And this is how we live one day at a time. It says to continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. Where have we learned to do that? Step four. Mark that. When they crop up, which they surely will, it doesn't say if they crop up, it says when this stuff crops up. So when, when we get into the bad relationship situation or when the children get sick or when the parents get sick or when, when these things crop up, these life things, when they crop up, what does it say to do? It says we ask God at once to remove them. So you've become sort of, you've evolved to a footing with this power, no matter whether you feel it or not, you're just following directions, but you've evolved to this place with this power where there's a right relation, which is, he's God, you're not. And you're at this place, and all you're going to do is say, God, take this away. And if you can't do that, there's something wrong with it. Even if you don't believe, do that. We ask God at once to remove it. Please, take this away from me right now. I am in pain right now. Please take this away. Where did we learn to do that? When these, six and seven, when these crop up, we ask them at once to remove them. We discuss them with somebody uh, immediately. When did we learn to do that? Step five. It says we make amends quickly if we harmed anyone. What steps? Yeah, then we resolutely turn our thoughts to someone we can be of help. To someone we can help. Well, that's how long that takes to do. You are now, when I, when I was asked to come here and talk about the 12 principles, talk about the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous, there's the principles of Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't know whether I'd be in a like-minded group or in a group of people who were just trying to get this thing. But what I do know today is that each and every one of us can live happy, joyous, and free if that's our immediate reaction when something goes wrong, when something goes doesn't go my way, when I think that something should be different or that's unfair or that's not right. When these crop up, I immediately ask God to remove them. Immediately ask God to remove them. It's what I do. God, please take this away from me. That doesn't mean all of a sudden it's gone. There's some directions to follow. I talked to somebody at once. I'm married to an alcoholic who's also an al -Anon. I got kids and people all around me, more people than I ever wanted. You know, I was in solitary confinement and thought that was a shitty place to be. Now I wish I could get a break. <laughs> Trying to figure out a way I could just return for three days. If it wasn't for the bean cake, I would go back. <laughs> but I, I just got to talk to somebody about you know, you know, you know what just happened? <sighs> You know, and hope they endorse my bullshit, which they won't, but hope. You know, I just need to talk about them, follow the direction. They cropped up, I asked God who wants to remove them, talk to somebody at once, I make any reparations that are necessary. If I've hurt anybody as a result of this stuff, if I spout it off, that comes off of snapping at somebody. If I've said something mean or nasty, I immediately repair it. I say, look, 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 look. I wish I could have caught those words before they were leaving my hole. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean that. That's not the way I wanted that to come out. I apologize. Is there anything I can do for you? I immediately turn my attention to someone I can do about. I find something I can do for you or for somebody else. If it's right in my presence, I have a home, I have people that live there, I got a lot of cohabitants. I can go and do something for somebody else. Immediately I can do it. That's all the book tells me to do. It doesn't say, go to the detox and find another alcoholic who's also not a drug addict and share your message with him. It's not what it says. 
It says, go help someone clean the dishes. It says, go help someone do, 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 do. That's what it says. It says, help fold the laundry. Help find, turn your attention to someone who can be of help. And all the while, while you're doing this, holding the laundry, in my head I'm going, I hate this way of life. You know, and then when I go to bed at night, I get on my knees and I thank God for a beautiful day. Because I'm free. I'm free of the beast. I'm free of the insane, most base part of the religious self. And I take that into all of my, into all of my living. And I don't understand. I can't see what's even remotely confusing about that stuff. You know, I, I get people who are buck against us all the time. I'll say, well, wait, and they, they challenge me. Well, wait a second, right in the heat of battle and all that kind of stuff. That's exactly when we're supposed to do this. We continue to take personal inventory. I continue to watch. I continue to be inventorying me, not the situation or you. I have to continuously look for me. Where am I selfish, dishonest, afraid? Where are these things coming from? When they crop up, God, take this stuff away from me. I can't live like this. You know? and that's how it goes. Love and tolerance of others is our code. And this is the piece, you know, and, and, and I'll just, I'll, I'll sort of just talk about this for a second. Is it, uh, I'd like to think that I'm very tolerant in alcohol tonight. Uh, when I get really sort of nutty up here at the podium and stuff, it looks like I'm very intolerant. Um, that's not necessarily the case. I don't believe that alcohol is not ever meant to be all inclusive because none of the literature I see says that. We've created a culture that, that that's the case. We don't want to turn anybody away unless they die or something. Drink. Or we have a book that tells us that actually what we're supposed to do is somebody's maybe not ready or not quite here for the right reasons or they been misdirected here. So we're actually supposed to tell them to belly up to the bar, have a couple of beers or have a couple, a couple of drinks. And if they can stop, hats are off to you. If you can't, welcome to AA. And when I say that from the front of the room, I get a lot of bad response. And I don't know if Alcoholics Anonymous has changed in the last 70 years, or if something's different about our program, or, or something. But that has never ceased, that has never failed, in my estimation. Is it spare somebody the agony of sitting in an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting when they're not alcoholic? They're not going to get anything that we're talking about anyway. None but the most desperate can swallow this unpalatable truth. Nobody will take these measures to reconcile their life unless they're desperate. Nobody will do this stuff unless they have to do it in order to stay alive. And that's what the books say. And they just won't do it. So we see fighting anybody and anything or anybody, you know. And, and Anthony and I talk a little bit about this and, and you know, you get know, all righteous and, and indignant and stuff and, and how you offend me when you come in and say I'm an alcoholic and an addict. And, uh, I can get right off of all that stuff, right? And don't anybody take that the wrong way. I don't want to talk about this afterwards. Um, <laughs> I got to this sort of pious place because I heard a message or two with death and weight, and I got to this pious place in alcohol so because I'm a pure alcoholic. And uh, I started throwing everybody out. And, uh, and I was alone. And, uh, and I realized <laughs> I realized that I need you more than you need me. I've always needed you more than you will ever need me. And all I can think about is that this wasn't just meant for outside of Alcoholics Anonymous. We cease fighting anything and anyone, even alcohol. And it says that sanity will have returned. And that, that, that would be indicative, indicative that I'm not fighting anymore. Uh, I was at a meeting in Welland, and uh, I started to talk. And, you know, as I was walking up, I saw this particular slogan that I wasn't fond of, and it was not an AA slogan, and it was on a slogan tree. Have you ever seen those beautiful slogan tree things? Where people have it like a tree and the slogans hanging on it and say, This is our slogan tree. And uh, just out of the, they just did a little bit of a sidekick while I was speaking and uh, kicked the tree down. And um, <laughs> I've never been asked back there again and, uh, in the whole Niagara area, actually. And uh, that's not what I want to do. I don't think that that's an AA message. Uh, uh, I just don't think that that's an AA message. So I'm trying, you, 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 you wonderful, wonderful people who have welcomed me and fed me and um, housed me, I'm trying to tell you that you're in the middle of my, my chain. I, I, I'm, I'm growing myself, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous. And uh, although I will always remain passionate about the love affair that I've had with Alcoholics Anonymous and other alcoholics, 
Um, I'm not here to tell anybody uh, what's right and what's wrong. I'm here to really encourage people and, and, and I myself to try and live by the dictates in this book. And it's not that I venerate the book. I believe in God. The book has led me to that place. And I think that for most alcoholics, that's the possibilities that exist for anybody who's an alcoholic who takes up this church, who takes up this book. Um, has anybody got any questions? Anybody got any questions at all? Anybody want to say something that pissed anybody off? You guys know all the stuff back to the experiences show that you know, helping another alcoholic, nothing else is better than that. Um, one of the things that I was, you know, I was talking about when we were talking about the why and the how, the spiritual principles and about uh, trust God, clean house, help others. The whole help others piece, is just, there's no area in the book where the directions are more specific than chapter 7. And what happened last year, and this is why I was so enamored by Chris and, and uh, um, Chris and Dave's talk last year, was because I had asked them to come up and take us through the steps. It's, uh, it's uh, Dave and Steps is the name of the plan, uh, the name of the day. And uh, they come up and, and they came to the table with chapter 7 and they took us through the steps via chapter 7. And it was absolutely brilliant. And it's all about working with others. Everything we do from the time that we admit that we're alcoholic and we open ourselves up to a power and we take inventory and we make amends, everything we do is to open up the opportunity to carry this message that somebody else who still suffers. And that's the, that's the goal. That's the goal. That's the membership drive that we're on. One alcoholic talking to another alcoholic. If we all got sober and knew everything, this room would be in. It would be, it would be in. And, uh, I've already learned more from you than I'll ever, than I have ever brought to you. I know I have. I just know I have. And, uh, to anybody who had me here, you guys, thank you so much. Thanks for having me and I appreciate it. Uh, we can eat seconds. I think there's lots of food. Um, but that's it. That's all I got for you. Thanks so much. This really feels weird. <laughs> I'm Marty. I'm an alcoholic. And yeah, I'm Marty. I'm Marty. Hamilton. Yeah, yeah. You seem like you know me for years. Um, <laughs> uh, I think I, I can almost maybe just pretend that uh, this is the first time any of you have ever met me. Um, I want to thank everybody. Really, uh, the friendship, um, the conversation, uh, even the questions. I mean, I don't have any. Answers, but I like to ask them anyway. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know. I don't, you know, I don't know a lot about a lot, but I'll tell you about Alcoholics Anonymous. We go anywhere and, and in any place and in a short period of time, we know we're home, and uh, that never seems to change. It doesn't matter whether you're in Costa Rica or uh, whether you're in Hamilton or whether you're here. And, uh, your welcome has been uh, has been absolutely wonderful. Um, it just feels like I've been talking all day <laughs> because I have you know, uh, a lot of people would, that know me well would think that that was the, my preference and I'm finding out maybe this was his way of saying yeah really you want to <laughs> you talk 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 I'll let you hear what you got to say and uh this is that. This is Alcoholics Anonymous, sort of in, in its purest form. We, we have these beautiful calls, the special meetings where we get together and we talk about this program and, and this, this sort of thing that is really this of this stuff and, and brought us to a new place. And, and that's very important, powerful, and I think probably the most important. But this is a format for Alcoholics Anonymous where uh, I share with you, you know, my experience, my strength, and my hope. But and I do that through telling you a little bit about what it was like, what happened, and, and when that happened, what it was like today. And my story, and I don't know if you picked up on it through the course of the day, is more like what it was like, or what happened, than what really happened, and what it's like today. And, uh, and I don't think that that's a, an uncommon experience. I think there's a lot of people that I've met that were around AA for some time, hanging on for dear life, didn't know it until something else happened. And uh, and away we go. And uh, again, I would be uh, I would be very um, I would be ripping you off if I didn't talk to you about that transition and recovery. So I'm really not going to belabor my past. I'm not going to stay there for a long time. Um, although a couple of people have been really sort of making reference to the fact that it might be interesting. It's really not, not that interesting. There's a lot of people here that have, uh, 
I've experienced the things I've experienced, done the things I've done. I, you know, I know that, you know, I talk about my dad, and, and when I think about my childhood, and I come from this home that was a, a relatively normal home in the environment we lived in. Lots of drinking, lots of fighting, lots of scrapping. My mom was the mom that she didn't drink, she didn't touch a drop, and dad gave her, and he was out with the boys all the time. There was lots of fighting. It was an Irish Catholic home, and, and so any sort of family gathering would be, you know, a great big toss. It started out really nice, and everybody would bring food, and it was just things like this, and ended up in a shit kicking, and somebody would get tossed out the door, and then the next week, you're coming back together to make it all right again. And that was the first thing he did, was just sort of just say, I really started about last week, man, you're out drinking, and you go on, and you on, and all would happen again. And, and as a child, I mean, you're witnessing this stuff. You just, all you ever really saw, though, was you just saw this change. Kids go out and play. We were talk, don't talk, don't trust, don't feel. I, you know, you would have seen and not heard. It was like, you'd go out and play. Okay, so all he would see is some sense of normalcy and then shit faced And something happened, in, you know, in between, and it was never really aware of it. And I, I was just raised in this environment of, you know, my mom was a deeply loving, caring, doting mom. Uh, I told you a little bit about my dad, who was that. He was violent, an alcoholic. And, um, Again, that wasn't that wasn't unusual for, for, for where I lived. It wasn't unusual in the community in which I lived. And all of us kids, we never talked about it because it was just the norm. It was almost like you would need to talk. So, here I am. I'm 12 and a half years old. And, and, and I implore you to think about your first uh, drinking experience. Not the first time you tasted alcohol or had a couple sips off your uncles or anything like that. Kind of stuff, steal a beer or something like that. The first drinking experience, I'm 12 years old, I'm in the basement of my parents' home. Now, I didn't know there was anything wrong with me until, it, until everything was right. I didn't know that I felt so freaking awful until I felt great. I had no idea. And I'm 12 years old, I'm in the basement of my parents' home, and I want you to remember that time. And I, and I just grab a bottle of beer. It's my first social drinking experience. I'm by myself, I'm in the basement, I steal a bottle of beer, and I take the top off of it. <laughs> <laughs> like that. I grab the other beer. This is my salsa drink. <laughs> <laughs> and I put the beer down and I sat and I waited. And I waited. And I waited. And this bottled up sense of tightness and despair and fear and stuff just left me. It was like it just left me. It was almost like you could see it leave. And I started to feel as good and as happy and as comfortable as I'd ever felt in my life. And I just stood there in the laundry room. There was a little bar fridge in the laundry room by myself, just reveling in this wonderful feeling. And for about 10 or 15 minutes, the world was a wonderful, blissful place to be. It was fantastic. And then the room started to spin. <laughs> and, and I mean, it kept spinning. It didn't stop spinning. And I went out in the living room and I sat down in the chair and it was sped up. It was really spinning. And, and I couldn't take it anymore. I got up. I walked into the bedroom and I sat on the side of the bed. It was sped up. I lied down. You know, everything I digested for three days started flying around the room. Like, you know, crap dinner and black licorice and hard boiled eggs and stuff. <laughs> it was all over the place. And, and I wake up in the morning, and my face is stuck to the pillowcase. I'm 12 years old. My face is stuck to the pillowcase now. And I got that feeling in my mouth. I can hardly breathe. It's so bunged up with tight. And my head is going thump, thump. Thump, thump. Thump, thump. And I'm 12. Thump, thump. And I think that's the single greatest thing that's ever happened to me in my life. <laughs> and I don't know what happened to you when it was, it's the effect produced by alcohol. It wasn't the, the drinking, or it wasn't any, it was the effect produced by alcohol. I had experienced the effect produced by alcohol, and nothing would stop me from going after that. Nothing would just get in my way. And I, you know, even as a kid, you know, I, 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 I became almost a daily drinker, almost a daily drinker. And, and the only way a 12, 13, or 14 year old can do that is if they're a good thief or a good liar, uh, would work. I'd earn a few bucks, we'd get country roads, apple wine, for a dollar eighty-five a bottle, good big magnum, good stuff. And, uh, uh-huh. and, uh, and we would drink that stuff and we'd be out in the bush. I was living in the Ottawa Valley in, in Canada, which is, is all about rivers and lakes and bush and stream and wildlife and fishing and rafting and Tom Sawyer shit. 
that's that was my life. Like that's what we were doing. We were disappearing for days on end, and, and we were okay to do that. My family was from the from the from the, the bush, and we were okay to do that. And so that's really what happened. And it wasn't that it wasn't that trouble was so trouble started to find me at a fairly at a fairly young age. But it wasn't necessarily just alcohol related. A lot of the people, if you're drinking like I am, you aspire to sort of be around people who are doing that on a more regular basis. And most of the 12, 13 year olds I was hanging around with didn't, didn't do that stuff. The older guys did, 16, 17 year old guys did. So that's when I started parlaying around with playing hockey and doing this stuff. That was my childhood and my, my young adolescence. But at 15 years old, now we had, uh, our family had moved to Burlington, Ontario and back down in the Hamilton area. And at 15 years old, I was on the floor of my parents' bathroom, and I was sick. You know, I was really sick. And uh, I didn't know, you know, I was bleeding, and, uh, and uh, it was off, you know, and uh, I started drinking, uh, I was drinking a lot. And uh, I screamed out when I was in the, over the top of the toilet, and I'm never, ever going to do that again. And I, I meant it, and I'm never, ever, ever going to do that again. I know I said it out loud, and I was screaming in agony with the pain that I was suffering from, and I meant what I said when I said it. You could have hooked me up to a lie detector test and I would have passed easily, but I'm never ever going to drink again. And that's the firm resolution with which I swore off over and over and over. You know, and you know, at three o'clock that afternoon, I'm at Clancy's, I'm going into about my fifth or sixth Caesar, if anybody doesn't know what Caesar is, vodka and Clamato juice. And uh, I can't believe you guys never heard of Clamato juice. But anyway, and, and you see, I can't remember what happened that morning. I'm, all, I'm into my fourth, fifth, sixth drink. And I'm getting relief, and I can't even remember the pain and the suffering that morning. I can't. I'm 15 years old. I'm 17 years old, and this is where my story takes a little bit of a turn. And, and, and I hope that if you caught any of the passion that I was talking about today, it comes from this place. Alcoholics Anonymous uh, was never meant to be a place where uh, we hide in behind walls and churches and stuff and wait at the door for people to come and shake their hands. That's what we do, and it's important that we do that. But we're supposed to actually go out and get and the reason that I'm so adamant and firm about it is because I had this little problem, like, uh, you know, they talk about the allergy in, in the book, right? Uh, when I when I would drink, uh, my allergic reaction, I would break up in handcuffs. So uh, what would happen was I ended up in custody a lot. And so I was 17 years old. I don't know why I got in there again. I don't know what brought me back to, what brought me back to jail. But I'm in the range, and the copper comes to the grill, and he says, Cause, there's someone here to see you. And I said, Here, I haven't had any visits for a while. I've been cut off from my family. And he said, They're pretty good man around town. So he's, you know, you should be good to him. And I said, Well, who is he? He said, Just be good to that. Now, this man, um, I'll tell you about this. I walk into this room, and I'm sitting there for a second, and this old geezer walks in. He's about 135 years old. <laughs> he's got this flat top haircut, like it's like. Like flat, you know, one of them brush cut dudes that comes straight up and it's flat. And he's a mean looking son of a bitch and he's got these eyebrows, gray eyebrows that are like long and they, they do this when he talks. He's got these deep cut lines in his face and he's always homicidal looking when he smiles. And this guy's name was Bob Melwin. And uh, I didn't know that then, but this guy comes in, he sits down and he introduces himself to me and he starts telling me his story. But the guy's 109. I, I'm 17. I don't give a shit. You know what I mean? Like, and he's going on. I don't. He's, he doesn't say, "Oh, I'm a member of Alcoholics Anonymous." I came here to share my experience. Friend. He came in and just started telling me a story of his life. Now, can you imagine? So he starts telling me this stuff, and I'm looking at him, and it's really sad. It's heavy stuff. It's really emotional. It's powerful. And he's keep talking. He's going on and on and on, and I'm reaching out. I'm going, it's gonna be okay, buddy. You know. And, uh, <laughs> You know, I put my kid in the car and I was going to slam my truck in the wall. And I said, geez, this guy's a lunatic. And I'm looking around like, this is my visit? I don't have a visit in a year. This is it. And, and uh, finally the guy goes, he gets up and he puts his coat on and he says, thanks. Thanks for listening to me. And he said, no problem, buddy. Keep your chin up, pal. He walks out the door and says to the coppers, don't let them weirdos in here again. <laughs> Anybody know what that guy was doing? Huh? No. He was having a bad day. He was having a bad day. He came to that institution. He said, is there like a part mental guy here that I could talk to? Uh, and they gave him me. <laughs> now, Alcoholics Anonymous, what happened? Was, like, it kept coming to me. I never came to the AAs. I didn't know nothing of the AAs. I didn't know nothing. All of my adolescence was spent in prison. I, I had this thing. 
And I would swear off. I was 17 at that point, and after a little while, and I found out what that guy's doing. UAAs were coming and putting on meetings. I could get TNs, I could get cigarettes, I could get coffee. I, those are the kinds of things that would entice me to go and listen to your guys' BS, right? And your stories were very much like this other guy's, too. But I would just sit there and I'd put up with it, right? And, uh, uh, <laughs> I just want to, you know, I'll, I'll just go right to the next sort of journey. So I'm 19 years old, and because of my sort of acumen for, uh, for intelligence, I suppose, I ended up in, in a federal penitentiary at 19. And uh, so I was really sort of, <laughs> I was graduating well through the system and uh, uh, becoming increasingly educated. And, uh, on a serious note, a very serious note, like I, I, because I want people to understand that uh, I'm 19. Uh, I wouldn't hurt a fly. I wouldn't hurt a fly at 49. I wouldn't hurt a fly at 19. But my life was washed over with violence. And uh, Kevin asked me on the way down about, uh, about some of those things. And, uh, you know, my first day, the very next morning, my first day in Millhaven Federal Prison in Canada, which is our supermax institution, a uh, man was stabbed in the head with a fork and landed on my feet. And everybody from the range, all the coppers from the range, come out and put a gun in my face. And I was up against the wall, and uh, I was stone cold sober. And I got nothing. I was 19 years old. Now, I had already been on my own for the last three or four years, but I was terrified. And you see, I come from that place where you don't show. The insides don't match you at times. They never did. And I got inside. I'm just, I'm, 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 I'm insanely fearful. And outside, I'm just looking cool. And kicking my feet. And nothing matched inside of me. I was a walking dichotomy. My insides never matched my outsides. And that was not drinking. It was always, it wasn't just about, I was a mesh inside. My life had been contrived of, of, of my own willfulness at every problem I ever had. And this was the result. 19 years old and I'm doing this bit. And, uh, I'm doing okay. And a couple of years passed inside of this institution. I'm, I'm drinking record albums and Lysol and I'm drinking all kinds of perfumes and I'm drinking anything I can get my hand on. We're making concoctions and brews and all that kind of stuff. I'm getting paroled and packed and brought back and it's just a mess. And, uh, I'm an alcoholic. I suffer from a, a problem and it's a significant problem. That problem is when I start drinking, I can't stop. And that's a bad problem. It's one of the worst problems I can think of for anybody who likes drinking. When I have a drink, I can't stop. That's a bad problem. What's a good solution for that problem? Don't have a drink. <laughs> All right? Don't take the first one. Every single time I took that first drink, I was stone cold sober. Every time. 100% of the time, I made the most insane decision of my entire life when I was stone cold sober. I hadn't had a drink for a couple of days, a couple of weeks, a couple of months. So I'm sitting down below. I hadn't had a drink in a couple of days, a couple of weeks. I'm in the workout pit, and there was this guy. And Alcoholics Anonymous keeps coming to me. I'm not looking for it. I'm not looking for it. As this guy, I'm just working out, and I look over and through the doorway of this institution. This guy sort of walks by. He just sort of, he just sort of flutters by. You know, like <laughs> very light. You know, he's just walking around light, fluttering, just flutter. And uh, I look up, and, and, and after a couple of minutes, I hear, burp, 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 you know, I hear the burping of the coffee maker, and I kind of smell the coffee, stick my head in, and go back and work out. And next week, same thing, same time. The only thing about prison is pretty, pretty set times. You know? <laughs> he comes walking by again. The next week, same thing. You hear the coffee maker, smell the coffee, look in, nobody there, just this guy. I'm going to stick my head in and say, hey, dude, what's, uh, what's up? He says, oh, not too much. I said, what's going on? He said, I'm having a meeting. I'm like, There's nobody here. <laughs> and he said, well, you're here. And so I said, no, no, what, what, what is it? He said, it's EAH. And I said, no, no, no thanks, no thanks. And I went back and I worked up. Next week he's back. And next week he's back. What are you doing? A sponsor tells me I have to do this and I want to stay sober. Uh, I don't know what a sponsor is, but who wants to be sober, man? You know, like, what is that? And he started talking to me about why he was doing this. He said, your sponsor's a stiff. And we started talking about, <laughs> there's an area up there where this, where, in Mill Haven where it's stunning. It's absolutely beautiful. Have you ever been up Kingston? Charlotte Lake and that whole area and Thousand Islands. And it's, I lived there for three years and never saw it, but he was telling me how good it was. <laughs> It's, and he's telling me about the fishing, and he's telling me about all the beautiful area in which, you know. And so this is how he was talking to me. Week in, week out, this guy would come. He'd put the coffee on. I'd sit and drink coffee. We'd talk about fishing. We'd talk about hockey. We'd talk about those things. We never talked about alcohol. Never talked about the A&Es. Never asked me what I was doing inside. And a guy, another con, sits his head and goes, what are you doing? Cos just says, TM, just talking to my name. So he comes in. After a little while, there's six of us sitting there. 
And we're all sitting there and we're planning bigger and better scores for the geniuses and, and what, how we're going to hook up when we get out and all that stuff. We'll be like, with you guys. And, uh, <laughs> so we're, this, and we're planning this stuff. And old Steve is just bubbling around. He's pouring us coffee. And he's, he's happy. He's really, yeah, he's really happy. He's fluttering. Just, he's a happy dude, man. And one day he comes in and he says, hey, guys. And he pulls these things out. He says, that'd be a piece passes for the 13th Institutional Conference of AA. You guys want to go? I said, well, you know, what is it? And he said, well, it, it's, it's a conference. A bunch of alcoholics get together. They share their stories. I said, no, thanks, man. I said, it's pretty lame. He said, well, there's a roast beef dinner and a dance. Said, Whoa, wait, so what? He said, there's a roast beef dinner. And I said, and a dance? Yeah, with chicks? Yeah. I'm an alcoholic. Help me. <laughs> All we're all <laughs> so, you know, so you know, we're pretty excited, right? This is a pretty exciting time, right? We're going to go to the A&A conference, and we're all, like, pumped, right? This is really exciting, and there's a rope dinner and, and, and a dance. And uh, so this is uh, 1986, 1985, 86. So we rock and roll, and, and, and I, I, if you've ever been in an institution... Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> it's nice to know that there's a few people uh, that uh, are familiar with uh, what I'm talking about. A couple of things we're real good at is cooking and, and laundry, and uh, that's about it. And then, um, but I, 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 well, I need some clothing. I need some clothing for this, this huge event. And, and uh, Millhaven has this thing, stores, and it's for people for appeals and court and anything like that. And you go down and you get, I got these beautiful gray slaps with a nice pink press on it, this beautiful press. It. And it's sparkling. It's just white shirt with blind me to look at. It was so white. I mean, we're good at laundry. I got this blue tie, you know, went like this. And I got a navy blue jacket. It had the round navy buttons on it. Those gold navy buttons. I had shoes, and uh, and uh, but I didn't. They wouldn't give me a belt and laces. I'm not sure why, but um, <laughs> and I and I look good. I mean, I, I put on the outfit, and I look good. I, I I got it all hanging up. I'm so excited. I'm pumped up. My heart's pounding. I can't wait to go. I haven't seen people in a long time. And uh, so that next morning, I, I can hardly see the night, but I get up and I put this stuff on. I look in the mirror and I go, see, grab a big blob of Vaseline and put it in my hair. And, and I look, okay, beautiful. You look great. And I look at the door, you know, and they go boom, 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 boom. And I walk out the door, I look down, all six of us, and that's exactly what you're saying. <laughs> and we're going to the anonymous conference. And uh, so the big green, in our big green goose pulls up the collar, and it's a great big green bus that says Correctional Services Canada on it. And we pile into that, and we're all in the chain, and uh, going to the anonymous conference. And, and we, pull, we pull up in front of the hotel, and all you weirdos are standing out there with your styrofoam cups and your smokes. And and, uh, and if you've ever had handcuffs and shackles on, which I'm sure nobody has, when you get, I don't know how they would work with you. When you, when, you go to, when you go to step down, they're always four inches shorter than they need to be. And so I go to step down, and everybody piles on top of me. And you weirdos don't even notice. You're just a welcome, welcome. We're going by it. You're going, welcome, welcome. So we go by it. We go down. And they, take, they take off all the hardware, and they open the door. And I'll bet you the room might have been maybe twice the size. That's about it. Twice the size. It was for conference. And it was, it was huge. I mean, it felt, and it was this many people times a couple. But it, I was overwhelmed. And I gotta tell you, untreated alcoholism in me is not a pretty sight. It's not a nice thing. And I felt something come up inside of me that I, I hadn't felt in a long time. It was fear, self-centered fear. And I started to, and I didn't have a fix, a pill, or a drink to treat that. I had nothing. And my heart started to pound, and I could feel I started to sweat, and I mad dog. I did the only thing I know to do. I stuck my chest out and walked across the room like I own the place. And that's how I always got my way in life. I always bullied my way through it. But I was terrified inside, and for the first time in my life became aware of it. I became aware of the fear that was filled up inside of me. And it was shameful and it was awful. And I gotta tell you, untreated alcoholism is in those moments. Being aware of it, it's, I've never been conscious of it until then. I walked across the room and I sat down and I got to my place of safety and then it started to happen. Alcoholics Anonymous is an unbelievable thing because it doesn't have any sort of, it doesn't have a definition. We can't describe it to people with any sane sort of explanation. You know, people ask us, well, what is the AIDS? Well, how does it work? Well, I don't know, let me see. I would show up, we shake some hands, we sit and listen to some idiot talk about being in prison, have a couple cups of coffee, have a butt, go home, stay sober that day. That doesn't make any sense to anybody else. But when we say it, we know what that means, right? We really know what that means. So this guy who's chairing the meeting, his name is Keith Punt. Keith gets up in his chair in the meeting, and he's actually from this area. 
And Keith says, is there anybody out there who's out on a big roll pass to the police stand up? And about 12, 15 people stood up and all you weirdos clapped. Oh, yeah, that's nice. Oh, you jailbird. That's nice. Yeah. And then he said, is there anybody out there who's ever done time? Could you please stand up? And the whole place stood up. And you could have heard a pin drop. Because it was just like this recognition that we were all together. And I'm standing there, and I don't know what's going on, but this young girl screams out with joy, and everybody just sort of collapsed in tears and in each other's arms, laughing and, and, and making weird noises that I hadn't heard in a long time. Joy. And, and, and I thought, oh, shit, I, I'm one of them. <laughs> it, was a, it was a place where it, that was when the moment when I knew I belonged here. And how does that happen? We can't predict that. We don't know when that's going to happen. But that, I just sat down, and it was almost like I was dejected. Like, I belonged here. And so this guy gets up and he speaks, and his name is John A. from Laguna Beach. Wonderful message. Powerful message. Have you ever heard of this one? He's got a powerful, he's a great message. Too. Now, I didn't know that then, because it was exactly the same as the old geezer who came to see me in jail. Because while he was talking, I was saying, man, if I had your life going on, I'd be drinking too. I'd be drinking more, you know. I mean, yeah, I'd never quit. And um, so he does this thing, and then, you know, just like usually the, the dinner was decent, and just like usually happens, you know, the, the lights started going down, people were moving the tables around, stuff like that, and I started feeling myself come alive. And if you're a daytime drinker like me, you understand what that means. When you start to see the sun going down, you start to feel, okay, I made it. I made it into the night. Now I can give it. You know? Now I can give it. And so I started looking around. I'm scoping the room for her. You know? You were talking about the ankle bracelet. I scope around for her, and I see her. There's three young people there, and I look across the room, and oh, man, she is beautiful. And my heart starts to pound. And I'm sitting there, and I'm like, that's the one for me. All my life, I've been waiting for her. I don't know where I'm going to take her right now. <laughs> so I go up and introduce myself, and right away, a woman cuts in front of me, and it's her escort. She's doing 15 to life for murder. <laughs> she killed her husband. So I picked the one in the room. <laughs> We can do that shit. It's magic. We can. And imagine them looking at me. I mean, we can pick the sickest one in the room. Like, you know, we had this innate ability. That's why we're here telling the bracelet story. I was laughing. We all just. Um, anyhow, so again, sitting there like a nervous wreck. This all this stuff is happening. It's all overwhelming for me. And uh, I'm having all of these experiences, and some of them good, and some of them not so good. And then old Steve flutters up behind me. He just. Sort of just flutters up behind me. He just puts his hands on my shoulders. He starts rubbing my shoulders. He's excited. He's really happy to be there. And we do that sometimes. And you guys are wondering what's wrong with us. So I'm sitting there and I said, you know, a little uncomfortable with him touching me. <laughs> <laughs> said, you know, back up there, champ. And he says, uh, he says, so uh, what do you, you think? How'd it go? And he said, how was the dinner? And I said, how was that right? And he says, uh, uh, are you ready to go? And I said, go, go where? And he says, we got to go back to the institution. I said, what about the chicks? What about the dance? He says, I lied. <laughs> <laughs> so the short and the long of it is, is, is really what happened is I had my first untreated resentment, and uh, <laughs> and I was pissed. And uh, I needed to, I couldn't wait for that guy to come back the next week. By the time he got back there, now what had happened, though, is that I had those experiences of all I was sitting there. I was highly conscious of them all. I wasn't really connected to the other guys that came there with me, but I was connected to this Steve guy. And I could recognize that. I recognized there was something different between him and I and me and them. I could just see that, that there's something happened when I got sucked into that vortex or that vacuum there when everybody stood up that I actually belong there. The guys that I came there with, they were doing exactly what they came there to do. You know, they were outside getting stuff scoring. They were doing what they needed to do. I was actually in with you. And then this, uh, uh, you know, when, when I get back to the institution, I, I started thinking about the steps that were on the wall in the room where he used to come in and put the coffee on. I started thinking about what you guys were talking about. And I looked at that first step and I thought, you know what? That shit happens when I drink. I, I get that first step. That stuff does happen to me when I drink. I'm, drink is not good for me. I'm not sure about what that second step means. That third step sounds ridiculous. Fourth step, I'm not writing anything down. Fifth step, who would ever tell anybody anything? Six and seven is bizarre. Eight and nine, yeah, I'm not giving back the money. Ten, I just looked and said, I don't get it. Eleven and twelve, I, you know, two, I, I don't know anything about this power, so we need not engage. And step twelve, I could tell people they could have what I have. They just did what I did. And I went around the institution. I went around the institution and did exactly that. I can't drink. I would lay at night and I would do an inventory in my head. I would lay at night and think about all the horrific things that I had done to people and all the horrific things that had been done to me. And I would wonder why I didn't feel good when I'd get up the next morning. But I would go around the institution and tell people, you shouldn't even try to say anything, man. It's pretty good. I'm feeling pretty good. Now, that didn't get me shame or sober, but it got me a parole. <laughs> That's what it got. You know? 
within a real short period of time, my CEO noticed something that happened to me. And something had happened to me. I didn't know something that happened to me, but something had happened to me. You know, and we were talking about it. Anyway, so what, what ends up happening is uh, I get paroled to this halfway house in Hamilton. And uh, if, if you've ever been in this kind of trouble or anything like that, and I know that this alcohol is my master, it's my problem. That's bad, bad things happen when I drink. I am not going to drink anymore. That's it. And that plan, that plan, that lasted for nine days. And on the ninth day, I started thinking to myself, you know, yeah, you laugh right away. I started thinking to myself, like, that's always a real good plan, right? So I started thinking to myself, you know, when I went into prison, my buddies, you know, since I've been in there, most of them are, uh, they got those, uh, what do you call them? You get up in the morning with a lunch box. Jobs. jobs. They got those job things. They got those job things. And you know when you go home and you open up the door and all those people are there to say hello. What do you call them? Families. They got jobs. They got families. All my buddies. I'm 23 years old now. All my buddies got these things. Well, I, I, I want those things. I, sure, I slipped off the path a little bit. I, I, I want those things too. So I went to the strip club to get them. And uh, <laughs> that day, and, and I wasn't drinking. I don't drink. I, I don't drink. I, got, I don't drink. I'm in an alcohol treatment program. I'm about 40 days sober. I don't drink. I don't drink. So I, I went into the strip joint. I sat down at the table, and the waitress asked the wrong question. <laughs> I don't have an answer. Other than the answer for the question she asked is, would you like anything from the bar? Oh, well, I'll take a couple of acts. Now, <laughs> Karen and I were talking about this a little bit. She brings a couple of drinks to, to the table, and, and, you know, I don't get a drink. She brings a couple of drinks to the table, and they're sitting there. And as I pick it up, and I'm drink, I, this is probably not a good idea. I'm going to have to piss test when I go back. Um, I shouldn't be drinking. <laughs> Make it a double, please. Um, <laughs> right? You guys know as you know the story of Bill W. and Honest this day, sitting at the bar. You know that story? He's telling the guy what alcohol has absolutely creamed him. And when the guy gets up to go to the wash, he comes back, Bill's got a couple of doubles in front of him. <laughs> Are you insane? And Bill says, I suppose I am. I had no mental defense against that drink, the first drink. My drinking problem isn't the one that I take at first and then the ones that follow. My problem is, is that I will always drink no matter what. And that's what separates me from anybody else with any substance issues. That's what separates me from everybody. This is a distinct society. Alcoholics, alcoholics, that's the issue. It's in between drinks that the issues, are, 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 that the issues come alive. I cannot recover on a non-spiritual basis. I will always drink. It's in between I am restless, irritable, and discontent. I take a drink, I feel good. I take three drinks, I feel fantastic. I take five drinks, I don't know what I feel because I'm blacked out. That's my life. That is my life. So that's what happened. For the next 14 days, I'm running around insane, and crying, and drugs, and everything. They're falling their way right into this halfway house. Hookers and everything, like you're like moving stuff right outside. The, it, it, this is what happened. They followed me right into the halfway house where I was. And my parole gets suspended. No, they, they, they took it as long as they could. They picked me up off the lawn. They, 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 they believed in me. I have vague recollections of what took place in those two weeks. It's foggy. But they believed in me. And they kept me afloat. And I'd go to your meetings every day, hammered. And you never kicked me out. I was talking about this. It was rounders groups in my, in, in my neck of the woods. Those are the groups I love. I'd sit at the back with a bunch of guys who aren't with us anymore, and we pass a jug up and down. I'd sign out. I'm going to the AA. I'd come home and him. And that was my life. The parole gets suspended. I'm sitting inside. And I'm in a, I'm in a, in a correctional facility, so it's a detention center. Access is limited. There's not a whole lot. I'm feeling it. Right? I'm sick for a couple of days, but when the mind starts to clear, i got two weeks to come up with a plan to get out of prison. My parole's going to be suspended. I'm going to be finishing six years there. I'm going back. i got two weeks to come up with a plan. And i got all my buddies patting me on the, time, on the back saying, let on, guys. Because I'm telling them, I'm going to stick, these guys can stick the program. I don't need them. I don't need, you know that bullshit talk? And these guys are going, right on, top left. I mean, they were glad to see me. I walked back into the jail. Go, hey, good to see you. We're in jail, man. <laughs> it's not good. You know, I'm kind of hoping you'd have missed me. You know, like, so I come back in. And that's the way it was going. And I'm walking up and down the range and puffed up and I'm angry. And see, and, and, and some of the people 
that can be a, to- a, a nice toxic poison for us too. Anger is a nice thing to feed. That can put you, you know, that can keep you just afloat for a little while too. So I'm feeding this rage. These guys can walk in and they say, you know, we've been talking to your PO, we've been talking to some people, you know, you're welcome, you're back into the community, we're going to reinstate your parole. And I said, oh yeah, really? You can take your AA, your big bug, your program, stick it up your ass. I don't need you, 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 I don't need anybody. And they said, okay. And they get up and they walk out. And I'm thinking, well, isn't this what we negotiate? They get up and they walk out. I walk back into the range and all my good buddies are patting me on the shoulder. Right on. I feel the stuff come up inside me that I've never felt before. It's a rage and a ball of hate that I have never experienced before in my life. And for about five to ten minutes, I'm walking up and down and realizing somebody's going to get hurt. I go to the grill and I say, can you let me in my cell? The copper lets me in my cell. And I go up to the window and I look out in this parking lot and see those two guys walking across the parking lot. Now, both those men were in Alcoholics Anonymous. And both of them had shared their stories with me at one time or another. And both those men were free men. And they had the same life I had. And I thought, why then? Why not me? And I flew into a rage, an absolute red up rage. I destroyed all my worldly possessions, like my comb and my toothbrush and, and your big books and, and, and the blankets and, and, and anything I could get my hands on. I ripped them apart. And I was pounding on the desk. And when I couldn't pound on the desk anymore, I started pounding on the stool. And when I couldn't pound on the stool anymore, I was on my knees and all four pounding on the concrete floor and I screamed out, I don't want to live like this. I don't want to live like this anymore. And I heard a voice say, we don't have to. We don't have to live like this anymore. July 16th, 1987. Now, I don't have any illusions about what happened to me in that jail cell. When I stood up, there was no weight on me. I, I could have floated right up to the ceiling. I looked out the door and all the guys were sitting there watching what was going on because they heard me screaming like an anything. They were calling me a bug and all that stuff. And I asked them to go to the man. And they came and let me out. And I said to him, can you just get back here? Can you just get come back? He says, no, I'm not back. I said, thank you. He said, please call me. Fifteen minutes later, those guys were back. And fifteen minutes later, I was on his couch. Back at the halfway house. And I was sitting there with my head down and my tail between my legs. And my, I knew I was done. I had absolutely undeniably surrendered. I felt the power and the presence of God that let me know that all was well and all would be well. And I was there. I was in that place. And that's minutes after that incident. And then I'm sitting there and, 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 you know, it's kind of like Harry Tebow talks about the restorative power of the ego. Let me tell you what can interfere with that. I'm sitting in this guy's office and I'm, I'm done. I'm finished. And this big, arrogant Scottish guy Stitches his head in the door, puts his arms up in the door like this, and he says, I'm your effing sponsor, son. And I said, pardon? And my tail started coming up between my legs. And my head started half an hour later. And I looked up and said, pardon? He said, I'm your effing sponsor. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. I know I've only been around the age for a little while and drunk for most of it, but don't people get to ask somebody to be the sponsor? He says, you're too effing stupid. <laughs> Not my feelings were hurt, right? <laughs> and inside my mind is you arrogant Scottish and, and, and out of my mouth came, okay. <laughs> no, in my mind, it was going crazy. But I could feel the ego rebuild it right away. I was in my most darkest, desperate hour. I would have done anything. I'm talking about half hour later. So I don't have a hard time with you guys bucking the system. When I leave my home for a night or two nights or three days, I don't have a hard time. I know how the mind's going to get back on trapping it. I get it, you know. So this guy says that to me. He says, we're going to go to meetings every day for the rest of your life. I said, hey, hang on there, boy. Hang on. This is in my head. He said, I was going to get a family and shit before I got interrupted. You know? <laughs> I got plans. And he said, we're going to meetings every day. And out of my mouth came, okay. And for the next five years, I was in that guy's back pocket. And if you were here today, you heard my message. I had a 1 in 12 program for 14 years. And for those first five years that I was in his back pocket, I went to meetings every single day. Because I had nothing else to do. I was incorrigible and could not be employed. I was arrogant and could not be educated. I was um, insane, so I could not be tame. So every single day I went to two and three meetings a day. And this guy was with me all the time. I was in his back pocket. I don't know about sponsorship. 
But this guy said that this is what we were doing, and all we did was I didn't drink, and we helped people. Every day. We didn't carry a message. We didn't carry that message. We helped people. We literally helped people. We built shit. We helped them move. We uh, helped them move. We moved. I mean, I never moved so many people. You know, hey, hey, movers. I mean, once people found out, Marty will move you. I was moving people every day. A lot of times at midnight, too. <laughs> But that's what we were doing. And, and the funny thing about this guy, and I, you know, is he would say to me, we'd be at a meeting, there'd be some young lady or something saying, you know, and I got no money for grocery stuff. Stuff like that. And Martin would wink at me. I'm say name. So he'd wink at me. You can edit that. <laughs> so he, 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 he would wink at me. And that night we'd go to a Sobeys or an all night or somewhere and we'd grab groceries and we'd go up to the, put them on the table and we'd hide in the bushes. Now, if you did that, now they'd charge you. <laughs> you could, uh, freak the ladies out. But, well, that's what we were doing. And, and we'd be behind the bushes like two little kids just giggling. And he'd say, no, you can't tell anybody this, son. And I said, well, okay. He said, no, no, you tell somebody it's going to wreck it. And I said, well, okay. And the next day I'd go to a meeting and everybody in the city would know. <laughs> you know? So my point in that is no matter what your sponsor says to do, do it. <laughs> they don't. <laughs> you know? Obedience. Remember I said earlier, obedience is the issue. I wouldn't tell anybody. And the fact of the matter is it didn't matter. You know, I was just charged with this sort of ongoing effort to just do what I was instructed to do. And I went to meetings all the time. And this was the two-step program that I had in my life. Now, in the meantime, I've engaged in, in, in relationships, and some of them effective, some of them not so effective. Some of them uh, with much more responsibility incurred, some of them not. Um, my, <laughs> my, uh, uh, this, this particular man, and, and we had a lot of adventures, and, and I'm sure that Kevin would love me to start ripping into some of those, but we had a lot of adventures in our sobriety because just like two guys who were unemployable and running around like nutcases, we got into a lot of trouble in AA and out of it. And uh, we didn't know that. We didn't know that. We didn't know that. And we didn't have, you know, I, and I don't care because i got to tell you, I just go to a sidebar issue here now. He absolutely resents the fact that I talk about this openly. And, and the problem is, is that I'm good with all of this. I, I'm good with the fact that I was a two-stepper for... 14 years and didn't know it. I know I, I know I did everything in my heart to help people. I know this stuff. And I know that at some point, somehow, some way, I touched the lives of people. I sponsored 20 guys with two steps. I did two steps. Step and a half. I know nothing about unmanageability. I didn't drink and I helped people. And you and me, well, start a moving company. And, uh, not drink. And uh, go to conferences. And I'm, I'm speaking all over the place. Uh, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm loving it. And I'm loving the people and you're my people. You know, and, and I talked about the family and my father and all that kind of stuff, but I won't get back into that. But what ends up happening is that five years sober, this guy drives up to my house and he says, you got a love and tolerance for people that I can't even. I told you about the 18-month four-step piece. Now I'm sitting there, I've done my fifth step, and I'm sitting there for another three and a half years doing nothing. Like there's nothing. And I'm just going to meetings and whatever. So now i got a one, four, and five, and twelve, right? <laughs> So here I am. I'm sitting in this never never land. He comes, drives up to my house to tell me because I really, really like people. And I'm involved in the community. And my life has sort of been funneled into helping others in a different way, in a professional way. My education and those things are supporting my life. But I really care about people. Didn't know it. But I found out that it's my strong suit. I had no idea. So now I'm starting to do it in a different way. Hey, can you got a love and tolerance for people I can inspire to? I hate all people equally. That's his message to me, my sponsor. <laughs> I hate them all. I'm not biased. I hate them all equal. So he says, you're ready to move on. I said, what do you mean? He said, you're just ready. you got to get another sponsor. So it was his call. I go, geez, I thought this was like breaking up. It was awful. I thought, well, what am I, what forever am I going to do without you? Eh? So I asked this guy, Tom, to be my sponsor. Now, Tom, Tom was a different sort. Tom wanted to talk about the 12 steps of alcoholism. Now. Tom wanted to talk about what it was like to be a man, because I was still a little boy. Tom wanted to talk, and I had a little boy with some responsibilities now. Tom wanted to talk about what it was like to love. Tom wanted to talk about what it was like to be a member of your community and do those things. Those are the kinds of things Tom expected of me. And that's how my life started to change. And it wasn't quote unquote via the steps. He started to get me involved in, in community stuff, community minded stuff. He started doing, getting me involved in things that were taking me out of myself. I had no idea that I was sort of enacting the spiritual principles of those first five steps without knowing it. You know, it was just happening around me and happening about me. So I had this absolutely fantastic 
Alcoholics Anonymous thing going on. And I love AA and GSI, Inner District Rap, DCM. I'm, I'm covering all the bases around service, putting in my terms here, putting in my terms here, putting in my terms here. Nobody in Alcoholics Anonymous in Hamilton, Burlington, Oakville area, Niagara, everybody knows who I am. I am, I am in AA. And I love it. I love every minute of it. Everything that's going on in Alcoholics Anonymous, I love it. And, um, I'm telling my sponsors, me, I'm telling my sponsors, sponsees, uh, stay out of relationships. Because I'm, you know, a relationship expert. And, uh, <laughs> what to do with the money and work, because I'm such a vocational giant and I'm so good with finances. I'm, I'm giving all of this direction to these 20 sponsors and I'm tired. People say, how do you sponsor 20 guys? And I said, barely. And I, I don't know how. I mean, I am involved in the nuances of their life, their marriages, their, their, their the passions of people in the family, and, and, and their, you know, I'm godfather to children, and I, I'm getting really entrenched, right? I'm the sponsor, damn it. I'm supposed to own their ass, right? That's the way it's supposed to be. I'm supposed, they can't make a move without me. No major decisions will call me first, right? I'm just doing what I was, I'm just doing what I heard. I'm just going, just doing what I heard. What everybody else would do. Okay, so that's 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 how it's working. And I said, what was that? What happened? And then what happened? I'm speaking at a conference in Windsor, Ontario. Uh, I'm going to try to run through this. I'm speaking at a conference in Windsor, Ontario. And I'm the closing speaker. The guy who's the opening speaker is one of the first guys I'd ever heard talk at a, at a conference in AA. And it was one of his first street meetings I'd ever been to. His name was Carl Cave in Dearborn, Michigan. And the main banker speaker was a guy named Mark H. from Houston. from Texas. Mark H. Mark H. Mark H. So, he's, he's, he's the, he's the banker speaker. So over the course of a couple of days, we're just fighting against each other and spending some time. And at one point, we're standing outside of the, uh, uh the hall and he's having like five cigarettes at one time. <laughs> and he's talking, he's talking about being healthy. He's a healthy dude, but he really is. He's, he's a giant. You think of James Colburn and think of the features. And, He's got a big barrel chest and he's pumped. You know, he did his pump iron. He was physical fitness. He was great, but it was the smoke. Mm -hmm. So I'm standing there and I'm having a buddy. He's having five and we're shooting the shit. And he says, uh, I'm telling him about my great AA. I'm telling him about what a great sober guy I am. And how I love AA. And how there's probably nothing left for me in AA to discover. And uh, that must have been the cue that he picked up on. And, uh, <laughs> As I was blowing my own horn, uh, he said to me, he says, uh, can I tell you something? And he's, I said, well, if you must. And uh, <laughs> he said, you're asleep, you're and you're awake. And I know that there's like-minded people in here who've heard that saying before. He said, there's a, a level of alcohol that's anonymous that you haven't even experienced. And I was offended. I was deeply offended. And I told him. You know, you know, we have a way of talking, people like me. And I said, who do you think you are? You know, who do you think, who do you, think you are? He said, no, no, no. I'm just telling you. I, I don't know where you're at or what's going on, but I can just tell from what I hear. Maybe there's more to this that you want. I wouldn't even tell you if I didn't think. He said, I meet people like this all the time. But if it didn't sound like there was something that you could use, I wouldn't suggest it. Well, I said, well, what do you got in mind? He said, I can take you through the steps right now. Well, I said, the steps. <laughs> I'm 14 years sober, man. They're on the wall. <laughs> I read them every week. The 12, 12 meeting I belong to. Every week. You can tell me about the steps. I said, you ever taken them? <laughs> now, you, now you're splitting hairs. I said, now you're taking them. He says, here are the steps we took. I said, no, I know. I read that at every meeting, too. But uh, no, I, I, I'm good. He says, I can take you through the steps now. And I said, well, no, I mean, well, we haven't got the time, and we need a couple years for that, you know? Like, <laughs> he says, how about right now in my room? Nobody had ever talked to me about powerlessness and unmanageability. Nobody. Nobody ever told me about what it was truly like to have the essence and the experience of powerlessness inside of me and to know that my life was unmanageable by me. Even in the 14 years of my sobriety, every single thing that had occurred in my life had been directed by me. And the glory went to me. There was no other prayer in my life. I had a pinch hitter God that I claimed great gratitude to when I would see a beautiful crane flying across the wall. Or when I would be humming across the French River in my boat and I would turn to my left and see a moose exiting from the woods. 
just before I ate them. And uh, <laughs> somebody asked me earlier if I eat moose. <laughs> See, like that was a surprise. Any chance I get? <laughs> so, but, you know, these are, these are my riveting spiritual experiences. These are my riveting spiritual experiences. And guess what, guys? I could always go back to the fact that God had introduced himself to me, himself, in that jail cell that day. And I could always go back to the fact that I had a profound and powerful life change and spiritual experience that I hear talked about from Bill's story, Marty Mann's story, and about 11 other people in the book. And somebody in this room tonight has heard the voice. And I could talk to that. I could lay claim to that. And that was what was keeping me sober, I thought, all of that time. And he said, you can't stay full on the food that you had last week. Spiritual experience is a daily thing. Well, where do you get this stuff? He talked about the big book of alcoholics and others. I'd never seen one of them. I've seen them around. I've seen them used to prop shit up and stuff. But I'd never seen them around. I'd never seen that before. When I talked earlier today, I was talking about the way I looked at that book and thought, how lame is this? 164 pages, large print, uh, lame, lame stuff for people in 1937, 39. That's, that's, that's what I thought. And then I'm sitting, he's going through this stuff with me, and he qualifies me as an alcoholic for the first time in area. Imagine that. I'm powerless and I need power. And he offers me up a, a proposition that I had never seen before. A step through proposition. That God that came to you in that jail cell in 1987, is he everything or is nothing? Uh, we talked about the Bush League pinch hitter stuff. And he made me make a proclamation that if I'm going to move forward in this stuff, it must be everything. Now, I'm talking about nine minutes. I'm talking about nine minutes. And then he said, would you do a third step prayer with me? I said, what's a third step prayer? He said, that's what you do when you take the third step. He said, that's your commitment to this program, to this life, because we're going to take this third step. And he explained after we took the third step what I had just agreed to. <laughs> and I didn't have a problem with that. Because I wanted it all. I told you earlier today. I'm as much a pig in, in recovery as I was. I thought I was getting it all. And see, that's the problem. Is that I'm not, I don't get mad at people. Or I don't get, I'm not, I, I don't attack people. I attack group thing. The whole area in which I, my community, in which I was, was getting sober, did the same things. It wasn't like I felt I was ever missing out on anything. I didn't know there was another level. And Mark called me on it. And then he asked me to put down some of my stuff right now. And he showed me what to do with it. And he said, do you want this stuff gone? Do you want these things gone? And I said, absolutely. Ask him to take them. I said, well, I talked about them in therapy. He said, well, that's not what this says. He says, ask him to take them. Ask him to take them. And he said, start setting right your wrongs. And that's when I left his company. We spent a little bit more time over the weekend. We talked about it. I was in contact with a lot of people over that weekend, and I had a new experience in Alcoholics Anonymous. And from that time to this, I've dedicated my life in Alcoholics Anonymous to carrying that message. Because the 12th step doesn't say having had a spiritual experience as a result of being locked up in your jail cell because you're going to leave your goddamn mind. Uh, it says having had a spiritual experience as a result of these steps. And I had never taken the steps. I talked about it. I had read them. I had examined them. I had watched John Marquette show and laughed about them. I had uh, I'd done everything about the steps except taken them. And I don't think that there's anybody, you know, when we talk about, and I'm working with you guys today to come up with these problems, to come up with these difficulties, to get, everybody, and we're talking about this too, everybody wants to do more inventory. I'm, 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 I'm big on inventory. I'm just not big on inventory all the time. More self-centeredness is not the objective. You don't need to keep inventory all the time. What you need to do is finish your goddamn amends from the first inventory. And what people forget is that that is the place in which we change. People don't understand. I, I didn't understand. And the guys that I worked with didn't understand. But that's, I went back to those 20 men I sponsored, and I asked them if they were willing to do this work with me, then we would do it. And over the past several years, some of them have done it, and some of them haven't. And I got a different level of sponsorship. And the way sponsorship looks in my life is just like the 10 step that I did with you a little while ago. If you're struggling, if you're an alcoholic anonymous, and you're doing this stuff, and things start to go bad, you don't call me. Don't call your sponsor. Don't call me. You ask God who wants to remove it. Then you talk to somebody about it. Then you make it right. And then you, what's the last one? Then you find somebody that you can be help. That's the objective. And very seldom do I get any calls after that, except the report. The next time I see them, somebody's walking up to me and saying, what happened? And they're passing by me and it's like, that's amazing. 
That is amazing. And what happens is it makes my experience in Alcoholics Anonymous richer. So I become educated. I end up in this, this position where I'm able to sort of uh, be involved in a, in, a, in a private counseling firm. And, uh, and we're very successful. It's a wonderful uh, endeavor. I love that we're going down to see the woman that, that, that hired me. And she's become my closest friend. And, and it's, it's an absolute joy doing the work I do. And I get an offer one day to come to this other place, uh, one of the biggest hospitals in that area, to work with people with schizophrenia and addiction. And I think, well, that sounds novel. And uh, uh, can you imagine, like, having delusions about delusions about delusions? Like, <laughs> it's an amazing, it's an amazing thing. And uh, so I just want to quickly just say to people, like, the reason I hang this out here is because this is not the same guy that was in that prison cell. This is not the same guy that was living that self-centered, uh, maniacal life. And now, you know, I'm placed in this position where I can, I can do this work and I can do it with the way that you guys taught me how to do it, which is with the anonymity and love. The, the people I work with are recidivists. The people I work with, just like other guys who come in here pissed all the time. I learned here that anonymity is the spiritual foundation of our program, absolutely. But it also means that that guy's his first time. Every time. You walk through this door. You're not that relapser. You're not that person who can't get it. You're not the every time you're walking here, something can happen to you. It can happen to you, and you get treated the same every time. And that's what my work is like. That's exactly what my work is like. Every day is a new day. People ask me how my job is, and I say it's like Groundhog Day. Remember that movie? Mm-hmm. It's like Groundhog Day. I can go to bat and do a ton of work the day before walking. The next day is totally undone. Say to the guy. Well, what happened? This is like saving, cleaning the guy's apartment. You know, I'm getting rid of uh, bed bugs and cockroaches and maggots, and I'm cleaning the guy's place out while I'm talking to him about his addictions. That's my job. I love it. I'm a generalist now. So I'm getting all this stuff out of there, and I say, all right, right, okay, I'll see you tomorrow. And I come back in, it's exactly the same as when I walk out. <laughs> what the hell happened? He said, you're not going to believe it. I said, give me a shot. He said, Satan stuck his arm and tipped the whole thing over. <laughs> No, oh, let's do it again. <laughs> let's get at it again. You know, that's what it's teaching, and that's what AA has taught me to do. So, in alongside of all of that, um, I end up in a relationship with Leslie, my partner, and my wife. She's got three little girls. I have my little girl, Gidget, and uh, we're living life. We live in a, an active AA life. My door is always open. Uh, I live in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. I'm not hard to find. Uh, if you ever need a place, I swear, you're not just blowing smoke. That's, that's the truth. It's the way I was treated when I came here today. Uh, that's that's the way our house is, is open that way. And uh, uh, she sponsors gals, and, and I sponsor guys, and uh, our kids. You know, I talked a little bit about my daughter Sarah. She's now back in recovery again, giving it another shot. Uh, Kevin reminded me that uh, it was just after Christmas, it was just after New Year, that she had just come back to us. And she keeps trying. Well, she was the one I was talking about earlier today. I've been chasing her on the streets, and she was 13, 14 years old. And uh, now she's coming back. And thanks, Jim, so much for sharing. That was really nice. You hear that stuff, you know. That's, that's why we're here. That's why we're meant to be here and be together. Because uh, when I get up here and I open things up, I just tear open my... I tear open my chest and uh, I let you guys have a look in. And sometimes you see stuff and sometimes you don't. And when you do, you come up and you say, you know what, man? I've been there. I know what you're going through. And Jim reminded me of me sharing our workshop with this, this little girl. And I can't imagine, I can't imagine sitting with Sarah someday. <laughs> uh, my home group, talk quickly about that and then I'll show up. Have I still got time? When people say not the men, he's no. Do I really got tennis? No. So, so what happens is this is this is this is where I'm going to slide into just an opinion or two. What happens is you can't. The experience I had down in Windsor, and then I came back with guns blazing. Uh, it opened up. You know, it opened up some. Some hostility towards me. Not, not, 
it, it looked like hostility coming from me, but it was his passion because I was really driven by the spirit. And I, I saw what was there, and I wanted people to understand and, and get in there with me. And, and, and so I started taking guys through the steps in my basement years ago. And, and dozens and dozens and dozens of men have taken the steps, had experiences, have gone on to help other people. It's an absolutely beautiful thing. That had never happened in the first 14 years I was sober. That had never happened once. Where somebody picked up this stuff and went and carried that message. That had never happened once. Now I'm watching it happen all the time. So I end up, you know, I'm looking for a group. I'm looking for a group. I belong to this group. Really quickly, when I first got sober, they gave me the keys to the group. And I wasn't like an unlikable guy, but I don't know why it happened. Everybody just quit when I joined. And um, <laughs> it was called the Serenity Group. It was one of the biggest groups in the world. As soon as I joined, everybody quit. And for about 18 months, I was sitting there alone. You guys didn't even come. I mean, it wasn't just like the group members left. Everybody didn't come. He said, it was like a boycott or something, but I would go down there at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, because I had nothing going on, I'd have a hockey stick and a ball, I'd be in a room like this, and I'd just be practicing, taking shots and all that kind of stuff, set up the coffee, 100 chairs, I would sit down at the head of the table, I'd have a little nap, I'd read your, you'd read your bullshit, and, and, and I'd just sit there, and, and nobody would come in, and I'd take down, I'd drink 70 cups of coffee, I'd take down all the chairs, and put pour the rest of the coffee out, and I'd go home. I said to my sponsor, I says, uh, you know, uh, nobody's coming to that meeting. He says, well, you should have bounced on And I said, yeah, but I, I think it's keeping me so Well, then keep it open. <laughs> and I said, yeah, but I told you, nobody's come. Just shut the, shut down, shut, shut, shut it down, right? But, you see, the fact of the matter is, is that something was happening to me there. I was reading the literature about 18 months in, 18 months, every Tuesday, I never missed. This guy walks up and he says, this is an AA meeting. And I said, it is now. <laughs> now, I love that group. And that group, when I'm talking about my middle of the road sobriety, we had, it was everybody. We had everybody in there. You could say whatever you wanted in there. We, we were talking about all that crazy junk, right? And it was a wide open, crazy meeting. It was a closed discussion meeting that allowed you to talk about anything. It shows you how much we knew. I was a treasurer and didn't know I had to pay rent uh, for like four years. I had never seen a parishioner in the church there, ever. No priest, no parishioner had ever come down and said anything to me at all. I just went in, put on the meeting, and left. Nobody ever said anything to me. Anyway, the reason I brought that up is because that's my initial group belonging. I love that group. The 10 years that group had to close down the church, uh, had changed its policies, and that was it. I think it grew to the subject. That was it. Uh, I joined this other group called the French Door Group. I would go there because I said if they ever moved their meeting from Friday night to a Thursday night, I'd join that group. And that's exactly what they did. And so I would go into the meeting on Tuesday nights and Thursday nights. Tuesday night open meetings, about 150 people on a regular night. And the, uh, the Thursday night discussion meetings about eight hairy leg old boys and me. And, uh, <laughs> and we would read the stories out of the back of the big book every week. And uh, so I would sit there and I would go in. You sit down. Now, I had this experience around that time with Mark, and I'd go and I'd sit down. It wasn't like I was operatively there to sort of set the world on fire. That wasn't my plan. I still believe that it's important for us to sort of converge and belong and acclimatize and love and tolerate and all those things. And these guys were talking about drinking the wine, and they were talking about the uh, their friends and all that kind of stuff, reading these stories. And, and three or four of us in the back of the room were just howling. We are having a good time. It's the same stuff every week. Every week. Same guys saying the same things every week. Nothing to do with AA. Everything to do with the stories in the bath and drinking the wine. You know? And so one day I said, you know, guys, that book in front of you there is a solution. You know? I'm going to go in that room next week and we're going to just talk about the solution. And they said, what do you mean? I said, we're not going to talk about the problem. I'm not allowed to bring your problems to this meeting anymore back then. And they let me do that. And I did it with other group conscience. I did it unconsciously. I just went and did it. The next week, there was six or eight people in that room, and there was uh, six or seven in that room. The next week, there was 14 in that room. There was two in that one. The next week, all of them guys had left. That wasn't my plan. It's just the end result. You will be offended by this message if it's not the message for you. And so we sat in that back room, and there were 60 people in the room this big. I swear to God, you could not pack another human being in there. And they said, why don't we move out to the big room? There's like one guy out there. So said, leave him out there. This, this is, this. And something started to happen. And from our meeting table, this message started to get carried. It wasn't just in my basement anymore. It was at my meeting. I was able to assist in effecting a change at my home group. That we are not going to talk about middle of the road sobriety anymore. On a Thursday night here, we're going to talk about the truth. 
And I said, I went home and I created a format. Yeah. <laughs> and the format, the format was, was nice. Um, but I said, it said in the format, it said, welcome to the Prince George Group. Uh, we're really glad you're here. Um, unfortunately, we really don't give a shit about anything that's happening to you or going wrong in your life. Um, and if you dare to bring that up, I will throw you out. Um, <laughs> This is a classroom format beginners meeting, popularized in the 40s, very much in existence in major metropolitan centers in Canada, the U.S., and the United States of America. Uh, it's your turn to listen. There are people here who have an experience with the solution to this program. You don't have it, so shut the fuck up. <laughs> a year passed. I read this format every week. The room was packed. A year passed. People were getting sober. But the old coots upstairs heard about this meeting that was going on downstairs on a Thursday night. And they were noticing a substantial increase in the seventh tradition. So they started coming down. You can't see that. You know, so I had to edit the format of town. <laughs> By group concert. A lot of people, you should have seen the vote. It was the biggest, it was the biggest uh, uh, business meeting we'd ever had. And there was a vote to edit the group conscience, or edit the format, the reading of the format. Down, so take out the F bombs, stop threatening to throw people out the door. Uh, you're not going to be punching anybody out. Like we had to get that stuff out of the format, and you had to go to vote. <laughs> so, but there was like 60 people at the business meeting, largest business meeting in the history of Prince George. And there, there was the vote was like 42 to 28. It was like close, <laughs> close vote, you know. And. Uh, so my format went out the window and I had to revise it, but I kept in all that stuff I made up and, uh, about U.S. and Canada and all that. I don't even know where I came up with that. <laughs> so what we have now is we have uh, taken a format very much like Dave is in, you know, in Sandy Beach. It's a classroom format, meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, where we will have experienced members share it. No, not share. It's not in share. It's a classroom format. So it's a, it's an instructional. These steps, if taken, can expel the obsession to drink and enable the supper to be happily and usefully whole. What's the question that a new guy will ask? Well, how do I take these steps? Well, let us tell you. Let us tell you in this group form. But I want to talk about my marriage, man. You came to the wrong meeting, dude. You know, I'll tell you what, and this is my testament, and, and Kev, anybody... This is what happened. I'm in the parking lot till midnight. I ain't going anywhere. We'll talk about that shit after this hour. When we give somebody some hope, when we can give somebody some hope that they're not going to die of this disease, then we'll talk about your goddamn marriage one more time. But then we'll talk about your, your financial issues again. All right? But for one hour, one hour, we want to pull somebody with a vision. Like we were trying to do today, man. Tell me, like, pull somebody with a vision and say, this is a program that's here for you. It was made for you, laid out for you, it's presented to you, it's laid at your feet. All we want you to do is pick it up. And we will walk alongside of you all the way. We will watch you get pins, we will be there at the birth of your children, as awful as that might sound. Uh, we show up at hospitals at the weirdest times. You'll lose family members and we'll be standing there. You know, we lost a giant last week. We lost a giant, Willie Fraser, last week. Well, it breaks, it breaks my heart when you lose these people, but there's a joy that comes alongside of it when I see the rooms filled with the, with the love and the people that, with the lives that be touched by this man. So, I, I can't, how can I not give everything I have to alcoholics and honest when alcoholics and honest is giving everything it has to me? Uh, how can I not? I mean, I, I have no illusions about what my life would be like without it. You are a, you guys are a, Okay. Well, thank you for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So, if you'd like to help us be self supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.